uh, welcome, uh, invite Professor Anduza on. Uh, we'll be chatting some fossil science today. Really cool genetic stuff too. Um, and the possibility of what it might mean for each other's fields. I hope that y'all are as excited as I am. I think these crossovers are a huge highlight of mine. Jonas Goodwin, thank you for the follow. Welcome in. All right. Hi, Danny. Hey, Blint, can you hear me? Yes, sir, can you hear us? Excellent, I can, perfect. Awesome, perfect. how was your stream today? Stream was good. Stream was good. Um, talked about a lot of mammals. To, it's been a lot of mammals this week. You know, I feel like a bit of a turncoat as a dinosaur. <laughs> I saw a beautiful 3D print that I was asking the raiders because I was like, I saw it in the corner of my eye. Yeah, this is uh, my ancestral horse here, Eohippus. Oh, it um, looks so I've good. Got just, a, just a few parts left to print. Basically, just the. The arms and legs. Um, I've got more parts down there on the floor, <laughs> but uh, this is life size. Like the first horses wow. that we have were were not big animals, about the size of a of a domestic cat. Or a Together we can rule the galaxy. That is insane. How organ wise, everything. It's weird. I want an if I just subscribe oh, well, to it, Prime. It, I had more of it here. It's not. No, no, no. But it's just like something like a cat-sized horse, right? Of just like thinking about the organ size and like the scale yeah. to modern animal. It's just cool to think about. Well, it's it's like a you know a, a fetal horse is still a horse, and it's it's got all the parts. They're just smaller. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is a wonderful example of what we call Cope's rule in in evolutionary biology, and it's that like generally all things being equal, a a lineage of animals their average size tends to increase the longer that that lineage is around. Um, and so today horses are bigger than they have ever been in the past. And they started off pretty pretty small like this. So Nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, I want a Niffler. Thank you very much for the resub. You get a piece of raw science added to our beaker. Thank you very Beautiful. much. We've been... Uh, <laughs> So, Danny, there's this game grounded that we've been playing on Thursday nights and talking about the, the science behind the game because you get shrunk uh -huh. down to the size of an insect. And what's really cool is the you're in a backyard, but the ecology of the backyard is built in a way that, that makes sense. Like there's um, uh, aphids that run around, and then there's lace wings that eat the aphids, and then there's underground tunnels oh, cool. with ants and the mosquitoes. And so you can talk about ecology, what they got right and wrong of the insects, kind of like how... When you were playing Saurian, yeah. like as the as the closest yeah, yeah. simulator of like dinos, I think this is. There's a video that has lace wings in it. Yeah, that's really cool. Actually, that's really really cool. Right, and it's like there's the larval yeah. stages too that feed on the ape. Like it's, they nailed a lot of the biology done well, like really well. And so you actually collected an element called raw science, and it <laughs> it levels up your brain power. Nice. And to like nice. let you make uh, do different things on here. So we started doing a, a beaker full of raw science that uh, we've been I for like our, our monthly sub goals. And yeah, there's an arachnophobia mode where you can the and or the the spiders look like little jelly beans. So for our community members who might be like, I don't want to watch it because of spiders, we can just turn on arachnophobe mode and people can watch and not be nervous about the spiders, like which is uh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although then I get scared because. it's the jelly bean spider looks like uh, some liquid that you can drink, and then it just like jumps alive as a spider, and then you're dead. We die a lot, but you uh. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know everything's a trade off, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like right, even of all these studies that we're gonna be chatting about today, feel yeah. like it's also on that yeah. trade off front of behavior and like the dis uh -huh. like discovery as well like i love the paper that you sent about um the Indi the science in india and like what the paleontological dig sites uh -huh. there are because it just i i guess i never thought of it of how little i know about india and the yeah. dinosaurs that come out from there like i just i uh -huh. I, I danny i know nothing it turns out i know nothing uh -huh. at all about them and, and we as dinosaur paleontologists don't know that much more <laughs> That's, that's the crazy thing. 
Um, India has the potential to be the new frontier for dinosaur paleontology. Um, largely because we just know so very little about that right now. So, uh, this this paper is a step in that direction of, of making India like a real major player in dinosaur paleo. So, Should we start? I'm glad you liked that. I was, I was afraid it was going to be a little bit too in the weeds, a little bit too arcane. So... So I found that I kind of like these in the weeds papers because I know so little yeah. that I uh -huh. just I just like to learn about these components and so it, uh -huh. it, it was I was, see I was kind of worried that the baboon paper would be a bit too in the weeds. <laughs> I've got some stuff to say, but it it was a little in the weeds. But man, they should have led with the whole baboon thing. That made it so much more interesting to me. And they almost it almost seems like they tried to sweep that under the rug. That it was about baboons. Oh, and okay, good. I, I wanted to, to ask that. you. I wanted to yeah. ask you about that too because I, I had to look back. I was like, "How is this being controlled if it's people?" And I was like, "No, wait a minute. It's baboons because it just wasn't a baron." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, it's. Yeah. There's. Oh a, man. It, it's some interesting, it's... interesting studies we got on the menu for your y'all tonight, chat. Um, should we start yeah, with it's, the? It's gonna be a fun one. Should we start with the Indian dinos? Let's can we start with the baboon paper actually sure. cuz yeah the the crypto baboon paper <laughs> um we we had a big discussion on my stream today about like the philosophy of science and how science is different from other like ways of knowing and stuff like that and so hopefully for anybody who's who's carried over through the raid this will be a a fun kind of uh expansion on some of those topics here but uh what what yeah, was the yeah. uh, the general gist of that conversation? It was kind of like, um, well, like oh well, if science is a human endeavor, how could it ever be? Uh, you know, why isn't it equivalent to like other ways of knowing? Because you know, humans are fallible and you know stuff like that. Um, it's like, well, how can you claim that science is objective and? So the thing is, like, science is the best way that we have of learning about the natural world. Like, it's it's basically that was kind of my my take on this. This was my take home message that I tried to get give, give to everybody is that scientists we're human beings. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We've got biases, all kinds of stuff like that. But science, as a method, tries to filter that stuff out so we can actually get to the truth. We can actually figure out how the natural world works by testing things rigorously. Um, but yeah, that was that was the gist of it, I guess. I think at least this study leaves a lot of questions open as well. Should we maybe we can watch the minute and thirty second video from the author as that kind of introduce what Let's the study it. Was? It was? It was a little. It, I was surprised at how like basic it was, like stock footage one on one. But uh... it, yeah, you're not yeah. the only one. I was a little bit disappointed, like when they had the the accompanying they're like this is the accompanying video to this paper i was like that's really cool uh-huh like what is this gonna oh. show us but thank you lordy holy cow i've got dinner here Ooh. lordy thank you so much holy moly enchiladas and a baked potato perfect timing um, <laughs> thank you lordy <laughs> and some sour cream i see for the baked potato yeah holy, and the enchiladas the whole thing actually. is sour cream i can just eat this with a spoon that you might have a a touch of Hungarian in you. My oh, grand yeah. my grandfather uh -huh. would he had this special chair that he would sit in. He would visit us from Hungary, and he would just uh -huh. get a tub of sour cream, and just sit in his chair, watch watch a show, and just eat straight sour cream. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. I I'm not I'm not that into sour cream, but I do really appreciate it. Like, I always see it as a luxury. When I lived by myself, when I'd buy my own groceries, it was it was a rare treat to have sour cream. Um, so now that Lordy does the shopping, it's like, oh, man, it's, it's so nice to have. Nice. Um, and I appreciate it very much, so. And uh, we yeah. got a... And anyway. We got a, a special guest here, XX Brandy. Welcome the heck in. Brandy just celebrated a Twitch partnerversary with a 24-hour stream. I think it was last week, Brandy. Or I can't even 24-hour streams all in a row? Oh oh yeah. Oh yeah, straight up 24 <laughs> hours. I think she went like 25 hours celebrating. 
Holy uh, cow. Holy cow. It was... Brandy, yeah. it's how much I can't keep the track. We raided into Brandy, and then, of course, she was still live the next morning, and it was just like, Hi again! I took I took a four-hour <laughs> four hour nap. How's it going? Together, we can move oh, the man. galaxy. Professor Anduza. Thank you for the resub, my friend. What? <laughs> Paleontologizing just no, subscribed yeah. for 29 months. Thank you very much, my friend. At the tier three, letting us put in three my more pleasure. plus points. Thank you, Danny. Look at all that raw science. Raw That's science. Nice <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, y'all, let's go ahead and watch this video. Um, this is just introducing the concept of what's behind the paper. It's not ideal in the sense of, like, all that they could have done in this particular video but it's at least like a brief introduction and i say not a deal because it didn't really go as far in depth as i wish that they would have but it's good enough to at least begin the paper and yeah there's actually i don't even there's not even narration so i'll just go ahead and read it read it out loud so the point of the study uh, males born to obese baboons. So this is all in baboons, by the way. This is it's <laughs> does not come across. I it it read as it was in people. Yeah, and I'm surprised by that. Yeah, and I just was it was like, how are y'all controlling for things and what is defined as obese and diet and all these like, factors? How could, how could they get approval for doing this kind of a study in humans? And then it turns out, oh, they they did. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I don't know again why they buried that, like, uh -huh. so deep, but. So don't worry, y'all. This is not with people. Um, so later in life, they are more likely to have diabetes, liver disease, heart problems, and stroke. So why this is cool, and I thought that y'all might be interested in this, and Dan and I have been talking about a lot of epigenetics, is this is similar to epigenetic phenomena that are passed between generations without changes in the actual DNA sequence. Right? So there's no mutation in the next generation. There's just difference in gene expression, and it manifests as these increased likelihood of having disease state uh, for a lot of different things. And what was really cool to me was that it was only in males. For some reason, it seems like the female offspring were protected. Um, yeah, well, on new research shows why obesity needs to be addressed in pregnancy. Medical research fellow at the University of South Australia working in medical research. In this study, we looked at how obesity during pregnancy impacts fetal liver development and how males and females respond differently to the complication of obesity in pregnancy. What we found was that males prioritize a pathway. That's right. Can everyone hear that, y'all? We yeah. have, they like, don't do have, have um, closed captions. Are you on. using Google Chrome? Because I, I might have a tip for you if, maybe I've told you this before, the volume master volume master plugin mm -hmm. is something that i use every single stream all the time when i'm whatever i'm watching videos like this because it like it helps you up the volume in the browser if people can't hear it and it i like it a lot okay no we so, i use edge <laughs> oh okay no worries, no worries. <laughs> the one yeah. The, yeah. The, and the reason for it because danny you'll have a heart attack if you see how many tabs i have open Chrome is such a memory hog, it's nuts. Like, I'm I'm actually in the process of moving back to Firefox because it's much less memory intensive than Chrome is. That's so why I, I sure. yeah, yeah, that's why I had it on yeah. that front. And then we've got um, uh, an ad blocker on this extension. Uh, so that's why nice. I've, I've been using the... Uh, uh, yep. and, and also that, then I... That is the most essential thing is the ad blocker, yeah. yeah, which is um, not that I don't support yeah. our creators. We always let them get their plug in. It's the things that on top of, of it, like that YouTube is taking. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I got some thumbs up from hearing chat, so like that they can hear. So, <laughs> and sorry y'all, there's no CCs on this. We do have CCs enabled on the stream itself, but there's none for this video. So I want to make for sure that video. Yeah, you can see how it's all grayed out right there. Yeah. CC icon that is regulated by testosterone, one of the male sex hormones, whereas females uh, prioritize alternative pathways. What this means is that males prioritize growth at the expense of adaptation, 
which increases their likelihood to develop liver-specific diseases in response to obesity during pregnancy in later life. So this study highlights the importance of understanding how obesity during pregnancy impacts the development of the fetus with a particular focus on sex uh, specific effects because it provides the evidence that shows that there is an effect of obesity during pregnancy on the offspring and that this could impact their health for life. We hope that this evidence will help uh, society look at ways that we can reduce the global burden of obesity in our population and more specifically during pregnancy. And so Rat Finky, I agree with you. The comment from Rat Finky is this is about baboons, even the video is very human centric. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what, like, all of that kind of took me is even the title of the paper, right? Of like, <laughs> what exactly we're chatting about. Uh, even the highlights. So this is usually chat, like, the, not every paper has highlights. But this is where I kind of go to as like the quick glance of is this going to be interesting or not. Um, is is Because it's, it's the authors are supposed to provide what they think are the biggest, coolest take homes. And so here, to me, is uh, this transition, this hepatic enzymes involved in testosterone metabolism and clearance are reduced in male fetuses from uh, these particular maternal obesity stop pregnancy. So that, to me, says that there's a maternal effect. So something transgenerational pointing to something epigenetic. I'm like, great, that's cool. Nuclear expression of this antagonistic AR form reduced in male fetuses. Okay, so they figured out what gene has changed. Great. Awesome. Knowledge gained from the study may reduce the burden of programmed metabolic dysfunction of offspring from maternal obesity pregnancies. That to me, and Danny, I, I want to know like your your take too. So to me, it said human almost. Like it had such a translational statement that I was yep. like, wow, that's that's a big claim. And it it took me back to these studies. We actually Lita talked about them last night on the stream. Um uh -huh. uh, the Dutch hunger winter, which is when yeah. uh, there was a starvation effect during World War II, and the next generation was likely to have more likely to have diabetes if it was during um, this period of starvation, and it's considered to be epigenetic. Lita's on the side of things where she's a bit more skeptical about the findings uh, versus mm -hmm. like other researchers, but like because it's just it's so hard to get data out when you're in such strong control right like there's course, or yeah. there's there's not controls it's like of, of how you're actually running the experiment and what other environmental factors could be affecting you mean when you're talking about people yeah in particular yeah yeah holy cow like we are we are the some of the worst lab organisms because we just have so many things going on yeah 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 and then then to me when it said this statement it was like well that's a really strong statement if, uh -huh. it, it, again because like in the paper I wouldn't have run uh -huh. into the methods first, right? Like, we're just, like, reading as we would right. have, even as a scientist not in the field. It's like, oh, this is what it's, this is what the information is telling me. And uh -huh. that isn't what the actual takeaway was. And, and Smikes in chat points out, too, is, like, the definition of obesity and baboons. Like, how does one define that? Like, that seems to be, like, a pretty big field on its own or... BMI index yep. in baboons, which we've identified in humans as a problematic measurement anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the nice thing about this study in working with baboons is that they've genetically profiled each of the individuals in the study, and they can trace them of, here is your normal diet, and everyone, yeah. is, everyone is controlled and within this weight range. And then they give uh -huh. them this high high fat high protein diet and then everyone shifts to this other range so it's a very predictable manner so it's i wouldn't use the term obese in the same way necessarily in humans where there's like different right. populations have different definitions and it's it, right it can be a very murky term this seems because it's mm -hmm. in one population which has its own issues right because you're you're not testing on a lot of genetic variants. There could be different effects just as a function of that, but neither here nor there. I think it's a better control. And so even in the paper, uh, it wasn't until you get to this like method summary that you find- Where you talk about baboons. Yeah. 
<laughs> and it's I actually they didn't talk a lot about the baboon background stuff. Um, I was I was kind of appalled by that, Blin. I gotta say, I mean, maybe we'll get to that in a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah, it. I, I don't know. Before we go into that rabbit hole, maybe maybe uh, if I might suggest that we step back back for a second. Do you know any of the authors uh, in this list, or can you say anything about this journal in particular? Um, to give us some additional context here before we really dive into it. Yeah, so I I don't know any of the authors. I am surprised that this paper went to this journal. So what I mean by that is it's a very niche journal, and niche journals okay. tend to be lower impact. Right. Um, the reason I'm surprised is because this seems like it could be a pretty big finding in the study of an inherited disease state as a function during development and pregnancy which could be a very important field to study which to me sure. meant like right off the bat like why it caught my eye was because it did seem like there's a transgenerational effect right there's a difference in gene expression they did show in the study from control moms and and not pups but babies versus um the experimental and that could have huge implications for a lot of different medical treatments along in the field uh -huh. but if it's that cool then why is it not in a higher tier paper right especially working on mm -hmm. on baboons because you know i worked next to the cdc as an undergrad and my master's at uh, at emory and there any like chimp paper was almost guaranteed either a cell science or nature paper or something very close be just because of the how little you're able to actually work with these animals and so you have to really plan out your experiments like we've talked on stream danny before of like mice how expensive they are and how you have to plan out every experiment and with monkeys it's even more so like it's even more regulated because they're so close to being human i would imagine it would be like an order of magnitude more expensive if not more yeah oh i, like I think yeah probably yeah. more even and then the regulations which i think we've talked about it's important to have place of like animal care yeah is even uh -huh. more complicated as you increase in this kind of means because the enrichment the animals have to undergo and have so they don't have depression and like there's a yeah. lot of different care features to be able to have so it's like if you're gonna do this study you might as well blow it out of the park right yeah it should be a high profile journal that you get published in like if you're gonna put all that investment into a study like this you should have a high yield afterward, and uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that you provided that context because I'm not familiar with this journal. I don't know how high profile it is. I didn't look up the impact factor or anything like that. It's but, it's low, which is which is a little bit troubling because like whenever I see like a you know a dinosaur paper that gets published in like a really really tiny journal. If there's like, oh, we've got a new giant dromaeosaur from the Hell Creek, and it's published in the the annual review of the University of Kansas Geological Proceedings or whatever, it's like, oh boy, that probably means that these authors aimed higher. They probably shopped it around to some different journals and were rejected a bunch of times, and so they had to kind of settle for this kind of smaller, lower impact journal, and. I don't know. Do you, without putting too fine a point on it, do you, do you feel like maybe that's what happened here? It, when we get into the data, I, it almost feels a little bit like, like last week's stream that we were when we were talking about the the robot dinosaur, right? And how I remember each, both of us wanted it to be three papers that had so much yeah, more depth. Yeah. Uh huh. This feels like Figure One. This paper to me. Oh. Uh -huh. Like, you've you've shown the phenomena, that would be like panel A and B, maybe. You've shown sure. it's a gene that's inherited sexually. That could be uh -huh. panel C and D of figure one. Mm -hmm. My next question, you know, is, does it go another generation? Right? Uh -huh. What is the difference in males and females? Like, they showed the gene that's different, right? Like... Males have this gene yeah. down-regulated, females don't. Great. Why? 
And then because we know it's epigenetic, the question is, well, what is the DNA state like? Uh-huh. Is it yeah. closed? Is it open? Right? How is that different? So there's like a lot of these, and it's, again, it's not knocking the finding. Um, uh-huh. It's just, I think it's exciting and you want it to be more. Right. And, and that might also speak to a certain kind of, um, incentive in academia where sometimes the publisher parish paradigm is not conducive to to good scientific work um yeah i mean do you think that has anything to do with this where it's like this could have been part of a larger study and could have been really really cool and they had incentive to just publish it before it's before they could really I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Blair? It's so as Smikes asked, if they did submit this higher and it got rejected, they could just have been going down the tiers. But what really gets me is like if you look, received in September, revised in November. So that to me says there were honestly no new experiments because on baboons like that, the timing of that, like I just imagine that would not have been such a quick turnover. Oh yeah, yeah accepted in december like just a few days after like late november uh-huh. resubmission accepted early december and then available at the end of december right so that that seems like a very rapid turnover mm-hmm. and so it's almost like they were going like I, i'm feeling the vibe of it's that publisher paris like we need to get something out whether it be for yeah. funding because of how expensive the animals are or because someone needed a paper to get a job something's off here something like that yeah and yeah it's like it could have been so much more important because again like kelly cakes welcome on in madame by the way like y'all we're, we're showing a paradigm of where if the mom has obesity issues or or like differences in hormone levels that can affect the offspring right that and not just like during the pregnancy but during the lifetime of that offspring that male will have a higher disposition to the disease states as a function of the maternal environment that's huge like imagine if we're if we're talking about a global health crisis now because there is obesity in people imagine what that might mean to the next generation who maybe are not obese because of lifestyle changes that you know they have but they still have these increases in in disease states like it could be a massive effect i feel like to the like the healthcare system as a whole and so like discovering like a huge deal yeah. yeah absolutely like that that would have major major implications for healthcare policy around the world and yeah, so why is it in such a small journal? It's, yeah. And by the way, I also just want to point out, brief aside here, I love how this is this is what these streams are supposed to be about, these crossovers like this. It's like, it's reading in between the lines of these scientific papers. Like, you might see headlines as a, a Twitch viewer. You might see headlines, you might hear about stuff on the radio, you know, scientists say this, or a new study claims this or that. You know, one of the big reasons why we, why Belint and I wanted to do this this crossover series like this is to try and kind of peel things back and show you from the perspective of scientists. Like, this is how these studies are actually done. This is how you read them as a scientist. This is how you, how you as, as Twitch viewers can be a more, you can be more informed consumers of science news. Um, it's... Yeah, because this sort of stuff isn't isn't really taught in schools. So, I, I this think... is pretty special right here, everybody. I hope you realize how special this is. That I don't know that you can have a geneticist actually talk about a paper about epigenetics, listen to his opinions about it, listen to his perspectives. This is some pretty cool stuff. Like it's it's hard to find this anywhere online. And so, I think the best part is cool that is. is that our our crossover of like from different perspectives too, like. You from the paleontology yeah. perspective on genetics papers, me from the genetics on paleontology papers. Not only uh-huh. are we asking each other questions and learning from each other, and hopefully chat is too, but like you're saying, like reading between the lines and 
teasing apart things that could be misleading. Like, this is the, the press release chat. The title has nothing about monkeys. <laughs> yep. Right? No mention of baboons. Males yeah. <laughs> born to obese women are more likely to be developed overweight birth and develop metabolic implicate. That, to me, has human written all over it. Right? Yeah. And so it's... Yeah. I'll be honest, it did suck me in. Like, I thought this was, whoa, this is interesting. And even, like, University of Australia researchers said androgens give men their male characteristics that are crucial in development, but if too many male fetuses grow too large, causing not only problems at birth, but impacting liver function as adults. That statement is 100% true of the paper, but not in humans. And again, they don't say in this media release that it's human, but tell me, like, I don't know, I did not think that this was not in humans given how it's written um and it was like even the measurements that they're giving talking about the sex differences malnourishment did they even mention the the word baboon anywhere in that press release if you control f for baboon Uh uh notes for the editor like buried at the very bottom tissue samples were obtained from fetuses of obese pregnant baboons housed cesarean sections taken 165 days Oh, boy. Yeah. I mean, to me, I don't want to disparage the researchers for this and say that they're, that there's any anything they did wrong here necessarily. Like, I think this might be more of a systemic problem in the sense that science funding nowadays is hard to get. It's hard to get funding for basic research. And there are, like, there is every incentive to try and 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 claim that your research is maybe more applicable to medical science than it really might be for humans. I don't know. If we just had more science funding, I like to think that we would not have issues like this uh, as prevalent as they are. Maybe that's naive, but I this really seems to me like a like a funding issue in that sense. Like there should be plenty of funds available to people who want to study this sort of thing in baboons, maybe as a proxy for humans, like that should be a, it shouldn't be a negative that that like you know we've got to kind of hide the baboon part, you know. I, I think, you know, uh, chat was mentioning reviewers, so the reviewers aren't going to be like reading the press release, so their press release is kind of the wild west, yeah. right? Like anyone can yep. write a press release, and it's going to be causing a lot of things, right? The Chances I will. Are this press release is was probably written by like the somebody like a staff member at the university department or like at the at the university itself they probably have somebody on staff who's like writing press releases for all different kinds of of fields not just in science but also in the humanities and this and that and it's like that's that person's job you know when i was at montana state university we had a press person like that and they'd frequently like mess things up all the time they'd like they just make really really basic mistakes and so we tried not to funnel it through the university press office because they they just screwed things up um maybe that's what happened here i don't i don't actually know maybe the researchers wrote the press release and they have incentives to kind of downplay the baboon part i don't know i really I, don't know i will say like they could have been a little bit more You know, I I feel like the reviewers could have indicated this a little bit more just in this, in the study itself. Like, Uh I don't know, I I don't know about you, Danny, I've gotten reviews sometimes back about, like, the structure of the the paper. They might be like, you should consider structuring something a little bit differently. Usually it's not, like, because of visibility, like, that things Uh are a little bit buried. It's more like, yeah, the logical flow. a little bit. Yeah, like, maybe the logical flow it would be a little bit better like this. Um, yeah. A question for you, Danny, from chat. Does dinosaur paleontology do anything kind of like this with the press releases, where it's things are a little bit maybe mis, slightly misclassified to drum up interest and get the funding? Or is it, is it it's so it's static, and so you can't necessarily overclaim? Like, what is the, the state of that? There are, there are a few tendencies like that in dinosaur paleontology. Like, if there are a few, like, hot topics where, um, 
I don't know. If your findings have, if they touch at all, even obliquely, on like the origin of birds or something like that, um, the press release will sometimes really overplay that part. Or if it's something to, I don't know. If we're talking about press, uh, if it's a theropod dinosaur, then often the press will include the name Tyrannosaurus Rex, even if there is no relation at all to that dinosaur, because they know that that'll get clicks. That'll get eyeballs on the article. Um, so like a size, like that a size sure. question, right? Like it might be like you found a large dinosaur, but instead of saying like it's larger than a hadrosaur, let's say you might be like it's uh -huh. larger than a T-Rex just because you can like that's more. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's that's a, a, a dinosaur genus that the public knows. And um, and they know that that will get more clicks if you can put T-Rex in the headline. Even if your your study has nothing at all to do with Tyrannosaurus, um, that's a definite thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there's also a tendency. This might be like science wide for press releases, but it's like, oh well, this rewrites our theories, or it it you know it or it closes the book on a certain idea or something like that. But I don't know if that's really particular to dinosaur paleontology. Um, that that's yeah. that's fair like i've seen that in insect genetics too it's like this solves aging you know like we, yeah. we'll have that yeah. and it's like well no <laughs> it doesn't quite solve the mystery <laughs> of aging yep yep um yeah but there is like that information kind of Together, in there. we can rule the galaxy uh -huh. cricket oh my goodness cricket coming with a tier three cricket underscore Very just nice. subscribed for 29 months Ballant the president. <laughs> Thank you, Griget. With three pieces of raw science going in. Thank very you very nice. much. Cricket for that tier three sub. She's actually live now, chat. Uh, <laughs> she's coming in and resubbing while she's live. She's one of our OG best of friendos. Go follow Cricket and go when she gets a follow alert, it, it like it pings her. So go go give her a little jolt of follow. She's good people. Thank you again, Cricket. Uh, so yeah, like in insects, I think the worst one that we've had recently, Danny, was uh, ants can smell cancer. Oh no. And it was like <laughs> using ants to fix cancer. And if you read the paper, what it was was that disease cells give off an odor just because they're metabolically uh -huh. undergoing different... Um, metabolic pathways and one of the byproducts is odor and sure. you can analyze it you can actually like check the composition of what's being emitted and you can see there's different mm -hmm. odorants and so they the researchers taught ants to be like hey if you like here's a, a y maze if you give sugar water with the smelly cells right uh -huh. of human cells you'll get sugar water and say uh, learn to associate a positive reward with smelly cells but the way the the article was framed like the general public was can't sm ants smell cancer so it was framed like i just let loose some ants in a in a, a waiting room and if they yeah congregate around you they'll go they'll go spell out the word cancer on somebody's chest yeah and then it's like oh we can use it as a preventative <laughs> study and we could save people early which sounds cool but yeah, that's not what yeah. it was. <laughs> that's not uh -huh. what it was. And it's so frustrating, too, because it's like... Think if you're, like, a general member of the public, you know? Like, you know, you're a, a humble bus driver or investment banker or United States senator. And you, and you read a, you know, a headline like that, like, oh, ants can smell cancer. And you go, can they really... What are those scientists up to? They're getting too big for their britches there, you know. Science, oh, they're making all these big claims. And, you know, that, like, that has to be detrimental to the public perception of science, I imagine. You know? It's something that we've had issues with fruit flies in the past. Uh -huh. um, where there was a big study on uh, fruit fly neuroscience for mating behavior. And uh -huh. it was the the press release for that. I remember was something along the lines of like scientists identify like neuronal pathway 
um, from brain to testes that controls mating behavior in male flies. Like that yeah. is a huge finding because you've linked behavior to the neurons, to even the molecule that's in the neurons that's triggering this behavior. But the uh -huh. way the the actually it was a senator issue was that we're wasting money on fruit fly mating, right? And so like it, it became one of those like really lightning rod issues of like why are we giving money to these scientists? Yeah, because yeah. It, it, because instead of like learning about like what the possibility was, it was almost going with like this grandiose title of. Again, yeah. like aim, it also aimed more than the paper claim, right? The paper was like, there's still steps to find out. There's presumably more molecules, like we haven't figured it out totally, but yep. And so it's it's frustrating that we have to be so careful sometimes uh -huh. with the, because you never know what the title is going to give people. And in this study, I would argue that there's a lot of misleading in the news story that could be for, you know, people might start in. At least I always was like, oh, is it immediately going to start telling us about what we can do to treat people, you know, who have obesity right. and help? And then it, it kind of got to like how Smikes was saying, well, what is obesity in a human? And because uh -huh. I started looking for those terms in the paper, like, OK, you seriously, like, like what? Because there's we're such a heterogeneous population, yeah. like it's different for different people. And BMI, we know, yep. doesn't work. And there's all these other metrics. And no, it was. Yep. It was baboons, which is is cool, but you know the press release was very misleading. Right, and uh, even the the paper itself, I feel. I guess we can get into that now, Balib. Um, I was super curious in this paper about which species of baboon they were working with, and they don't say. I even looked for the, I did a, you know, a control F search. You could do it right now for genus Papio. P-A-P-I-O is the genus for baboons. They didn't say which species of baboon they're working with. And like as a, as a paleontologist, that sort of thing is deeply distressing to me because it's like, if we can't define the, the taxon that you're working on, I don't know. It, it just felt like a huge oversight. It's like, I've told you this before, when I've gone to scientific conferences, you know, I, I've crashed some scientific meetings before um, with like environmental scientists or even like, I went to a genetics conference one time. And then, um, you know, like you walk through the, we walked down the poster hall and you see like, you know, all of these people talking about different model organisms and stuff. And there's not a single image of any one of their like study animals. And like you ask them like oh well oh, what does this look like and they go well uh, uh mm, mm. You know, I, I don't know i've never actually seen one and it's like maybe that's not something to be worried about but to me as a paleontologist that just kind of blows my mind that you could be that divorced from what the animal actually is and in this paper they didn't even is I couldn't find an actual mention of the particular species of baboon that they were working with. Because there's so like it, five it, or six species of baboon. It's not so. just you who's frustrated by it. Like, I, yeah, it yeah, is okay. one of my biggest pet peeves is when I go uh, to a scientific talk and I don't know yeah. what you're working on. Just like, uh -huh. yep. they, like just, and it, I, I've been to a lot of talks where at the end, it was at like, I don't know, 30 minutes into the talk, I found out it's bioinformatics. And it's not even like, <laughs> which is fine, but they don't, they're using other people's data. And I was like, are you using cell lines? Are you using like live ants? Yeah. Like, Cause it wasn't phrased quite in a way. And so here, uh -huh. what I was concerned about, which is the same thing you said, I was looking for the genus species because they mentioned in the methods that a cesarean uh -huh. section was performed at 165 days at gestation. Okay. Right. And to me, I was like, all right, is this where in development is this is this a preemie is this allowed to mm -hmm. go full term like just like the basic 101 questions and they did mention like the terms 180 days but i'm like i don't know so i actually did some digging and i did find that this is uh there there's this it's the m amboselli baboon research project in collaboration with princeton okay and so they had a bunch of the data like 
looking at these animals and seeing like what the gestation time is um so this is like off the princeton huh. website and talking about like with with citations of like what's studied and like the aging of these animals and when they hit menopause and when they could yeah. do like what the family group structure was like social relationships so what what kind of baboon was it? was it an olive baboon a hamadryas baboon it was uh, the olive baboon olive baboon that yeah makes some sense okay. um yeah. but it would have been nice to know yeah absolutely like how i don't if i were a reviewer reviewing this paper i'd be like okay step one you gotta say what kind of baboon it is um just like disregarding that is is nuts to me i yeah 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 and uh and dame karen asked the important question like how premature are they similar gestation time to humans so uh, yeah. the, the full term for these is 180, 178 days. The average seems to be uh -huh. a, a little bit squishy, right? But that's a slight range. And so they uh -huh. they did a C-section on every one of the individuals at 165 days, which I was trying to look into what that meant. Like, why 165? Like, what about that magic date? Because they didn't mention in the paper why that date was chosen. But if you dug in the references it seems like that was a almost agreed upon day that these kinds of studies are done um, where it's huh. old enough where the animal is totally developed but usually none are given birth at that point and so the okay. reason they so it was didn't a safe time to do the, the c-section there yeah they didn't want natural births of these animals because we know there's effects of natural birth like on the on the animal on human babies like that's a a translated effect and they just wanted to remove that variable okay i get that totally on board for it um but like that justification would have been really helpful versus just i don't know the beginning of the methods we did c-sections yeah <laughs> yeah and, and right is like yeah. is, is it early is it so early in the animal's life that the like was the baby okay like i'm having like all these like uh -huh. almost ethics bioethics questions coming through my head but then i was like blunt hold the put a break on it let's take a look and see what the biology is behind the animals and see you know right. what it, and, and then all of a sudden it kind of went i'm like okay i get now why they're doing this but uh -huh. i just i really wanted that extra background to it and Dame Karen, they did outline like when they did the C-section, like a, they got the appro proper approval to animals comfort, like all those things are outlined. So I do want to say this isn't like some loosey goosey study with random people collecting monkeys or apes or whatever, and just doing whatever they want. It was a very meticulous thought out cared for the animal kind of study, at least in that description. I was surprised we didn't get housing mentions of the animals like for the methods oh, they, they did talk about that in the in the paper itself didn't they but like they said they had they had 16 different enclosures and they had uh proper social time and everything else i think i think i remember reading that so it's maybe that wasn't detailed enough though to me not detailed enough so usually gotcha. Fair. they should have yeah. been going like it for these types of papers like as smike says there is this like really important uh outline for like ethics laws in here and when i've seen like uh -huh. a cdc paper on the chimps that they are studying there's a very thorough this is the setup this is our 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 personal way of like laws put in place to keep these animals safe and comfortable here it like uh -huh. the, the like the united states laws and how we're complying and here's the university laws on top of it. it's like really be transparent yeah. Uh -huh. And I wonder if this is a little bit because I don't think it's just because it's from Australia. Yeah. Okay. Like, I don't know. I, I guess I haven't read that many papers from Australia, but this doesn't feel like it's just a different style. I think it may have been just, you know, some, when I've been a reviewer on papers, I've been very meticulous on a lot of method sections where I'm like, this isn't <laughs> And so I think the reviewers weren't, weren't full enough. Raiders, welcome the heck in. Fair. Actual education. Ah, uh, actual I, education raided into my stream yesterday. That's what I was. I was like, y'all, this sounds very familiar. Welcome the heck yeah. in, y'all. How was your stream? What were y'all chatting about? Um, welcome, <laughs> welcome. 
uh, guys, go check out our friend Actual Education. Uh, what were you all chatting about today on stream with some science and technology? I see some mathematics. What was the mathematical ease that y'all were doing today? We have uh, uh, AMS Monkey, welcome on back. We have Shifter Isok, first time chatter, welcome. Actual Education, welcome in. Uh, yeah. We did graphics. I'm going to be right back. i got to check out my 3D printer. I'll be right back. Yes, sir. We did sine and cosine stuff. Ooh, very nice. Some good trigonometry. Actual education sounds lovely. If there's anything you want to share with us, feel free to drop it in the chat. We will get you that fancy pan shot in just a moment. We just shouted out our friend, JC the Trash Panda, who's uh, a maker and crafter in the community who just popped on in here. JC, I hope you're doing well as well. Obama, welcome on in, Raiders. Uh, for the Raiders coming on in, my name is Balenz. I'm one third of Science Streams. My wife, Lita, and I, we have our PhDs in Molecular and Systems Biology from Dartmouth. We did our postdoctoral research at the University of Pennsylvania. And we do interactive science streams here seven days a week with microscopy, art, sci-fi, science, science news of the week, deep dives in scientific topics, games, 3D printing, IRL streams, model building, and more. Today, we're doing a crossover stream with Professor Danny Anduza of Paleontologizing. If you all do not know him, you're out doing life right. He is the single greatest science communicator on the internet. Not just Twitch. Not just the YouTubes, as Danny says. Not just the Google. But everywhere. Uh, his name is highlighted in the description of the episode today. Please consider, and by consider, please, please, following him as well. Uh, welcome the heck in, Raiders. Uh, we're chatting about this potentially misleading, I think definitely misleading at this point, paper on baboon obesity and transgenerational inheritance of so it means inheritance of different gene expression in the male offspring of an obese mom baboon it's a lot to unpack there and how that might affect translate to humans um, it is the press release we chatted about is very misleading because it does not mention a baboon except the very bottom like is like a side note to the editor uh, and even in the paper it, yeah. it's yeah in, in the paper it's not so you hit the methods where you actually find out what they're working on and so we're dissecting kind of the behind the scenes thing that we suspect may have happened on it but also talking about what is the science here um like the actual data is really cool and and hanny the baboons aren't considered um as close as let's say the bonobos like they'd be the closest yeah. relatives but a right. baboon is considered as for a model organism for easier to work with than a chimp um so yeah. it's still like close enough in relation where yes you'd still have to do a couple of additional steps i think to validate but it's a pretty close model for what would be in a human um, at least the current yeah. state so of baboons the are they're, they're still african apes so they're part of of that clade, but they separated from us probably, you know, I can, shoot, I can look it up on um, on WebZoom right now and see about how far ago it was, how long ago it was that baboons and the human Raiders! <laughs> and we got yet another raid from Dr. Excellent. Wildlife. Welcome the heck Ooh, in, Dr. Wildlife. Right stream. <laughs> <laughs> how was your stream? <laughs> Dr. Wildlife, tell us what you were up to today. Welcome on in, Dr. Wildlife. First time chat. More science and tech. Y'all, we just got double rated by two science nice. and tech streams. We're growing. We're taking over Twitch. We're doing it. <laughs> Sunny Cluster, first time chatter. Doc Raid, welcome on in, y'all. What were y'all up to? Please tell us. We love meeting more and more science and tech fans. We got rated by Actual Education a moment ago. And now we're having a raid from Dr. Wildlife. Zoology class, first part in a four-part uh, in a four-part series about the love in the animal kingdom. Ooh, this was bird mating. Very nice. Very, very cool. Is this, is this is a lead up to Valentine's Day, perhaps? <laughs> Ooh, I like that. I like that. I hope this very is cool. like the Valentine's Day. Spe it is. Nice. Heck yeah, Dr. Yeah. Wildlife. Guys, go check nice. out our friend, Dr. Wildlife. Hit that heart button on them right now um, for more science. Uh, for the Raiders coming on in, welcome. Uh, my name is Balint. Oh, thank you, Danny. One third of science streams. The other two thirds are my wife, Lita, and our daughter, baby Alona. Uh, Lita and I are both PhD scientists with our PhDs in molecular and systems biology from Dartmouth. Uh, we worked on uh, behavior, genetics, and epigenetics in fruit flies. We did our postdocs at the University of Pennsylvania in 
Uh, Lita did in planarians and stem cells. I did in ants, epigenetics, and behavior. And we're here on Twitch seven days a week doing uh, interactive science content. Today we're joined by Professor Danny Anduza, the single greatest science streamer on Twitch. His name is in the channel description. He says the, he, he, he waves me away, and that's how you know he's also humble in addition to being brilliant. Go drop him a follow as well. Y'all, welcome on, and it's great to have y'all here. <clears throat> we're crossing over chatting about um, fossil science and um, right now a paper on inheritance between generations in baboons using obesity, maternal obesity as a model for inheriting um, diabetes and other potential long-term disorders in the animal. Uh, Dr. Wilde said, Quanti quantitative biology PhD, uh, have her who studied bioacoustics, specifically how tigers communicate and behave. That Very is really cool. cool. Those chuffing noises that tigers make. Did you study that, perhaps? Very wow, cool. That's really, really cool. I, I would love <laughs> to pick your brain on how you study a tiger, because that could be... That's really, really cool to be able to study them. Math and biology Great. had a ter terrible, ugly child together. That's my PhD. I mean, it's... <laughs> I mean, Dr. Wildlife, like, if you looked at our PhDs, like, <laughs> Lita's got, like, a, a nice, like, multi-chapter, but, like, brief data set, and mine is, like, two volumes of madness. It's, like, 900 pages of a thesis. <laughs> one of us was able to be brief. The other one just continued to go on. And so, like, yeah, exactly, Dr. But the dear Lord, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But y'all, welcome on in. Uh, we were just looking at the relationship, Sunny, thank you for the follow, between uh, baboons and humans. And there's this yeah. am amazing tool, if anyone wants to play around with it, it's called um, One One Zoom. There is the link that y'all can play yeah. around and like look at the relationship of in terms of evolution between different individuals. Um, so here are our baboons. That's Venus papio right there there's here it only says there's five species other people disagree they say there's six but yeah and this and, is uh if you zoom out a little bit further you can get to well yeah you've got your baboons there but then you can get to primates as a whole and then humans too yes let's see yeah all so the old, old world, world monkeys, monkeys monkeys and apes and let's see the howler yeah. monkeys like it's, it's a really amazing tool yeah, to be able to have and what's nice y'all like funny, we can, they're not as close as i thought they were we well we can get from like let's see the i just i like the animation yeah that's the coolest thing is zooming in and out with that. yeah it's like there are this is the olive baboon that they were using in the study and yeah. then to humans we can do a little bit of a zoom in and out so it zooms us out. It takes us over to the other. Pretty, really, it's pretty close. It's just a hop, skip, and a jump. Yeah. yeah. It's like a. It, it's not like the difference between humans and lab rats or something. Well, but yeah. even that is like relatively close. Like this is. Spikes yeah. was saying it's 92 yeah. to 95% genome similarity. If we jump uh -huh. from humans to fruit flies, I just want to illustrate like yeah. why this is an important thing to study. Let's go to... I love Drosophila kikawai. It's one of my un, unmet loves. Drosophila nice. kikawai. All right, we're going out a far ways away. <laughs> it's about 70% similarity. Right. And, like, look and I, at... I always wondered about that, Valent. Like, because I've heard so many different figures for, like, how closely related humans and chimps are, or humans and fruit flies, or humans and bananas. And yeah. And... How do you actually quantify that? Is it like number of base pairs or is it, is it what? Because I've heard so many different figures. There's, yeah, there's a lot of, oh gosh, misleading kinds of ways that you can present the data as, as unfortunately many things are. So like you can yeah. do, I think the best way of doing it isn't the nucleotide sequence, but the genes themselves. So it's the model okay. gives you a little bit of wiggle room where there might be mutations in the second and third base pair of an amino acid, but sometimes, even though there's mutations, it makes the same protein. Okay. And so you account for it. it's like the gene body is the same or the function of this gene. It's like uh -huh. nucleotide wise, very similar. There's some differences, but it makes the same gene product that does the same right. thing. 
And so that's okay. the way that you get that similarity measurement. And then you also remove, um, like when it's humans versus fly, humans might have a bunch of repetitive elements that are non-coding that just can't be sure. present in a fly. And so that's that's not a similarity that you would look at. You're looking at this what's in the lower, quote, organism. And then, I think I was just about to ask about that. Yeah, like so, like gene duplication events. Do those count? It's not like you become only fifty percent similar every time there's a gene duplication event, or like a genome duplication event. Like you, you just kind of ignore that part, right? Because like lungfish have had so many different instances. Yeah. Yeah. When we went thought pet hippie, another batch of raiders. Welcome on in, pet hippie. Nice. How is? How is your stream? What are we all up to today? I see there was some no game. What were y'all doing today on stream? Uh, let us know. My name is Balint. I'm one third of Science Streams. The other two thirds are my wife, Lena, and our daughter, Baby Alona. We're research scientists, and we do interactive science streams here on Twitch every day of the week. Microscopy to art, sci-fi, science, science news, deep dive, scientific topics, games, 3D printing, IRL streams, and more. We have Professor Danny Anduza here, who's the number one science communicator on the internet. Uh, paleontologist extraordinaire and uh, we're doing a crossover stream as we do on wednesdays chatting about genetics fossil science and more uh, from each of our perspectives welcome the heck in y'all petty says watercolor painting very cool feel free to share any nice. link in chat that you would like um and thank you so very much for the raid welcome the heck in everybody oh and raf think you was wondering about your beverage item uh danny oh yeah yeah that's my measuring cup it's you know it's can we get some paleo cups going on in the chat? Um, <laughs> this is a, it's a long term, it's a long story, but yeah. It's a good one. I really, really like that emote. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. There we go. There's yeah. the emotes coming on in. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when there's a gene duplication of that, for example, um, one of my favorites, Sonic Hedgehog. I know you've talked about it on too with uh, your inner fish videos that y'all have we've watched on your stream, as well as yeah, here. Yeah. That's originally described in fruit flies, but then in humans, there's two additional hed hedgehog genes. Um, but that du huh. it's a duplication from that original one. They just gotcha. have like an additional okay. function now. Uh huh. Uh -huh. They do something a, a little bit different. So when you're shifting back to the fruit fly you're not going to put that gene back and say like well they're missing this one because of how you're you're tracing the genetic lineage rather that remaining 30 percent is something that's insect specific that's not in a human gotcha and so it's okay. like but those metrics can be very different you know of how you're identifying what the differences and similarities are some people like go for the base pairs and then everything's uh -huh. kind of shifted into a different direction because you can have changes in base pair that doesn't change the amino acid or the protein. Uh -huh. And But if you just do straight up base pair comparison, you'll get a lot more differences. And I, to me, that's such a conservative way of presenting the data uh -huh. that it's, it's almost, that is also misleading, right? Because huh. you're not getting the real picture of what's happening. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Do you, what, how do you feel about that? I don't, I don't know. I've always just kind of wondered about this, like, how do geneticists actually think about that? I don't, I don't know anything about this field, really. <laughs> it's not my field. Um, but I just always kind of wondered, like, when you've got genome duplications and stuff, does that mean that you're only 50%? You know, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That, that was that was helpful. It's nice to know that there are different perspectives on this, and um, there's not like a single solid figure that everybody agrees on because the idea is more complex than that and that's kind of how I would expect it to be does that make sense yeah, yeah. it could be frustrating right you're trying yeah. to just have it yeah. I mean and that's the same with like when you and I have talked about what is a species uh -huh. <laughs> because yep. that is also yeah. not an agreed upon and, and term it, and, it, and it goes against like people in the general public many members of, of chat here you probably want to be able to memorize a certain figure and you go, oh yeah, well, you know, humans and bonobos share 99.5% of their DNA or whatever, but other people are going to say 98% and like, we don't, we don't have like a hard and fast number right there. The point is we share almost all of our DNA. The exact number is almost irrelevant at a certain point because there's different ways that you can measure it. 
and uh, yeah, I feel like that's true of so many different things in science that like people try and package into a neat little sound bite that they can use, but you know, the natural world doesn't always like to conform to our our neat and tidy numbering systems like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, Epic Realms, thank you for the 100 biddies. Hype for these two awesome guys. Appreciate that. Thank you, Epic Realms. <laughs> I don't know if there's two Dannys, the second Danny behind Danny, but I appreciate you nonetheless. <laughs> um, what? what? <laughs> <I'll pull it. laughs> oh, no, it's previously <laughs> recorded Danny. There are two Dannys That's there. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, he's he's uh... biding his time until the next stream right now. <laughs> He's it's not the time for that. Yeah. The first time I saw that, I was like, I love it so much. The previous <laughs> recorded Danny. Yeah. Dame Karen, I've been nerfed. The chat already nerfed me. Um, Nelf says, exact numbers of many things really don't matter. Men spend too many time in the weeds. Yeah, so I guess, Nelf, the biggest thing here, right, is that why we're studying the bonobo instead of a human i mean there's ethics right that's oh you mean baboon baboon sorry yes baboon um <laughs> i was already on bonobos yeah um yeah this is the paper's fault though because we had it hidden away anyway but exactly yeah it, it's you know it's close in genetics and the question isn't what are the difference is like on that minor scale but rather it's that we have we're so similar and yet we come out so different so it comes out the gene expression and even you know then this model if you can demonstrate that you have a controlled situation where there's a particular diet for each of these animals whether the mom is on a high fat diet or a regular diet and the males of their the offspring of males produce with like these disease states and you can replicate that then it comes to the translational effect of it okay this presumably then is present in humans too given how genetically similar we are and we know there's a public health issue of you know obesity in the general public and so here are downstream effects that might happen that we can model in a in a baboon and maybe cure in a baboon right and then try to have treatments in a human it's the same thing that we do in flies as well, right? If a, flu, a fruit fly, you can give them a disease state. Like, I think someone in chat asked earlier, I think maybe Hanny, can you give ants cancer? You can. You mutate one gene and you can give an insect cancer. It's called APC. It's mutated in all colon cancers in humans. That same gene huh. is in an insect. That shows that, again, that genetic similarity. And if you have colon cancer, yeah. I can almost 95% guarantee you it's a mutation in the gene APC. And so you wow. mutate. So that's that's conserved all the way from from ants, within hymenoptera, all the way up to us within mammalia, within primata, within. Yeah, that's, and like that's Sparky wow. said of like wow. that, the one zoom gave us made us dizzy, but that huge yeah. distance, that growth factor is conserved, and so you can actually turn off that gene. It's a tumor suppressor gene, right? Like uh oh, even by its name, you turn it off and you get uncontrolled cell growth. And so you can actually feed an ant a molecule that turns off that gene. And because you feed it, it'll end up in the gut. And so you actually can mimic a gut cancer-like state where instead of having nice single cells in a row, you start having these like blobs start that start growing within the gut tissue. And then the question is, okay, I've, I've misregulated it. Can I cure it in the ant? It's the same genetic target as in a human. And so all of a sudden, it's not just the pop media article that I've cured cancer in an ant. It's like you're chasing the molecular mechanism behind cancer and how you can fix it across multiple organisms. And so that's the same thing here. It may be a not so clear way as to why they're studying a baboon to make potential inferences on a human. I hope that answers some of Chad's questions about that as well. Um, <laughs> And like, again, it's like Danny and I were maybe talking about like why we'd love to see more data here. And, and again, I feel like, you know, it, it's it's clear they're, they're showing gene levels and differences. Here's like the male offspring. You have to worry about what genes they are, but if we just zoom in, like you see this component here, this is a, oh, it made the figure smaller, Chad. I zoomed in and it made the figure smaller. That You gotta love it. But here, 
right this for this gene it turns up higher in uh, animals that were from starved mothers and it was like okay that's pretty obvious right this one in female the same one in females there's no difference now and so it shows you like okay there's something unique about the males and I where my kind of hang up in this study was well what is it like what's different between the male and female because if it's something as simple as there's a protective gene turned on in females during development can we just turn that on in the male I mean that's maybe a very naive way of thinking about it but it's almost like you have built in protection on a genetic level yeah and, and yeah. yeah only the males and Sparky the males had a higher risk of heart disease um, they didn't do any starvations, Dan Karen. No, no, no. There's no starvations here. Uh, there was either regular diet or there was a high fat, like obesity style diet. They did not go the starvation route because, again, of safety concern regulation for the animals. Um, as, you know, you can starve a fly. You can do the starvation experiments in a fly, but not in a mammal. Um, so that is like no animal was uncomfortable during these experiments but they still you know they did the tests and so i do wonder like what's the translation here like what could we have found out in doing a deeper comparison of the male and female i also would like to have seen the genetic structure so we've talked about with epigenetics it means there's accessibility to certain genes with the chromatin structure like maybe it's tied together a little bit closer so you can't gain access and turn on the gene or maybe it's the opposite it's more opened up so you do have access to genetic elements. I think that would have been like a, a silver bullet to really make this paper higher tier because it would provide some mechanism um, to the animals where it, it where it, like the phenomena, like here's the genetic change and here's how it happens versus just genetic change, it's sex specific, we're done. At least that, that's how I, I felt about it. Again, like, the, the genes themselves look very... Like, yes, there's a huge difference between male versus female. Uh, like, do you feel it? That's pretty robust right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, that's even, like, you know, by eye, it's like, oh, yeah, that's there's a big difference there. Of course, the spread is a little... You know, it's a little spotty, but, like, it's... There's definitely significance here and between the treatment groups. Like, that's great. You know, we're looking uh -huh. good. There's... A lot of individuals like relative to what you can get this almost looks like mouse numbers right huh. like usually for with mice there's like 10 5 to 10 individuals and that's what you're seeing with the baboons here too i'm like all right that's a pretty good replicate number for something difficult yeah. to get replicate numbers on um it's just afterwards like that's just it for the data that's why i feel like this is like figure one panels a through c maybe uh-huh where it's like i'm left wondering you know what like what happens to their these offsprings offspring uh-huh um that's both for the male and female like right there there could be effects in the female that we don't immediately see because uh -huh. we know maternal environment affects all fetuses all offspring um uh-huh what about those males there's been studies in in mice in flies that males can pass on this kind of epigenetic inheritance so i would be interested in seeing their offspring i know that takes time yeah. so uh -huh. like the uh -huh. paper would have to take longer and then sparky said why it's only the males and then what's like kind of the what is the genetic element causing these differences and i feel like you almost have like a great setup for the experiment because in females you don't see it and you do see it in males so you almost have like a built-in control in these like overfed female offspring by just comparing male and female embryos and seeing like okay well what are the differences in the gene expression between these two um, right. so I, I think you know to get back to our original point of why it's not in a higher tier paper I think it's because I it's kind of just like scratching the surface and leading to a lot more questions than what we have, wow. like any answers to. Didn't they talk about androgen and how that was supposedly what was, um, like the, the male embryos are prioritizing growth over 
protections against these diseases or something like that. Could you could you talk a little bit about that maybe? Yeah. Like, so what you the, thought about it? Like they the way they're the way they're demonstrating that the males are growing faster is that uh -huh. at that certain day of gestation the 165 days they weigh both embryos like as they're taken okay. out you know and they're like oh the males weigh more and uh -huh. so that to them was they are developing faster so while they're both in for 165 days they've developed a little bit further along and that's why they weigh more um in terms of a mechanism for uh, hello hi uh, i've got a visitor <laughs> too right there, yeah. <laughs> in terms of a mechanism like i don't to me that signaling molecule almost doesn't feel like it's yet true hmm. like to me you'd have to go in and Just either block, block the molecule or express uh -huh. the molecule in the absence of obesity, in the absence of an obese, overfed uh, mom, because it's it's it seems more like a correlation. It's like, well, we see this is also this is the gene is going in this direction. Um, gotcha. Yeah. And so, like, is it really that that way of going about it? Um, how many yeah. baboons were in the study? Nelf, that's a good question. They had. They had several females that were pregnant. They had, all, for offspring, we had... Sixes. Six, six. For males and females across both conditions. So, like, in terms of numbers, it's on the higher front. Of Guys, thank y'all for the follows coming in. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> and then there is, um, as Elephant mentioned, baboons have sexual dimorphisms do with do. different sizes. Yeah. But what they can do is they can uh, compare the non-overfed and fed what males, and then they're, that's one like at the same time point. So even though there are dimorphic differences in terms of sex, that comparison across control and experimental yeah. would affect it. Now, Chad's bringing up important components that Danny, I don't, I did not see how the fertilization was taking place. Uh -huh. I I did see like. The only thing that I really saw about the males and how they housed them was after the the birthing of the fem like the females gave birth or had the C-sections, they were returned to a group with males that had vasectomies that could not mate with them to protect the female. Oh, okay. Huh. But like where the females originally were mated from, as Golganak uh -huh. mentions what the male social status was, like there seemed to be like that level of detail Mm -hmm. was not put in now that's one of that's, that's a double-edged sword right i think it's a little bit sloppy we should have known that but let's say they didn't account for that and it still gave these results right that would then argue that those are not important features that contribute to the behavior <laughs> the genetics and the behavior bless you excuse me bless you dan thanks <laughs> um but i still would have liked to have seen a golden act like what is that you know paternal effects originally like what is the what was the feeding state of those fathers and social states yeah. like we you know i know that there are studies in mice that show like if you give an adult mouse male nicotine and get it addicted to nicotine somehow uh, the give a mouse a cigarette well <laughs> <laughs> i think there's a book about that <laughs> If you do that, which is which, I think is fascinating, is the next generation of male will have a slight addiction to nicotine, even though the the baby's never been exposed, just from paternal exposure. Right. So there might be. Wait, if you give it to the male, the father, then the offspring, fathered by that male, will have a slight addiction. Wow. There's even a. So it, it's. It's easy to imagine that, like, in the context of uh, a mother passing on something like that, because the the embryo is gestating within her. But if it's literally just the male's gametes that are contributing to, like, that's that's really wild. Yeah, wow. and it's it, it seems like it's something in the um, 
the ducks when the sperms are being pro- when the sperm are being produced they're not having these epigenetic uh-huh. marks wiped they're having them almost uh-huh. reinforced and so it's not uh-huh. even like a y specific thing um it is it is sex linked but it's not just acting on the y for some reason it's acting with like on the male side uh-huh. of lineage there's there's another one where it's a similar idea that i think is even more striking where you pair an odorant with a shock to fathers uh-huh. and you teach the males that this smell should be fear the yeah. next generation of offspring fear that odor and actually show like an increased growth in that bulb that olfactory bulb that mm-hmm. detects that odor even though those offspring have never seen it before that's so wild yeah so there's wild. definitely paternal effects um huh. Again, this isn't demonstrated in humans, y'all. That was in mice and rats. But I guess the point of this study is like, well, what is happening with the the fathers here? Like, we looked strongly at the the maternal side of things, and we saw what the controls are. I'd be interested in knowing what was happening with the fathers here, because that could also be informative, right? If the fathers are eating a regular diet, you know, it could be actually another follow up question, right? Like, what if the fathers are also eat, also having a high obese diet are is it going to be double is it irrelevant like you know you can see like a lot of different extra questions start happening sure yeah um but yeah like this was their summary figure which you know figure right there it's uh it does not look like a baboon fetus i mean maybe yeah no (sighs) right again like (laughs) why i was uh, also confused and then i thought well yeah. this might be a fun paper to chat about Bro. and the importance of science sure. communication uh thank you for that what do you think the odds are that they when they were planning this out they were hoping to work with human subjects and then that didn't work out like is there any possibility that that's the case or do you think this is a group of people that are like this is a laboratory that always works with baboons or you know, I get the sense that they fell into baboon data. Ah. Uh, like, that they had a collaborator okay. with access to these baboons. But I, when I read into, like, the what the leading author is in the lab, like, what lab they had, uh-huh. it was primarily, yeah. like, human tissue collection, like, a human, like, tissue bank data. That makes sense. And I, but... It, they had to settle for baboons here. But That's it... That's basically what happened. But it's almost like I don't want to say it's a real experiment they had access to because that's, you know, I don't want to be putting it down. But there are those cases, right, sure. where you have a bioinformatic lab and you just kind of take what you can get, like in terms of what uh-huh. databases are out there, like what tissue has been sampled and how to really learn about those tissues. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like it's like they fell into the opportunity of doing these experiments with like almost a human analog. And it yeah. was just like... Yeah. Like, they wanted to read more into it than before they were ready for, you know? Like, again, I'm not trying to put yeah. put it down. Like, I'm, I was excited by the finding. I just think it needs a lot more before you can make these kinds of figures. Mm-hmm. Like, these kinds of figures need, like, you know, we need 16 figures before you can get to this. Um, uh-huh. But in just in terms of mechanism as well, like, I just feel like there really wasn't enough hmm. brought in. Uh, which is again i thought it was similar in vein of like i really love the robot dinosaur paper last week but then again there were like a lot of assumptions built in that we hadn't yeah. pro- that we hadn't identified yet right like yeah the grasshoppers that were on the sidewalks for example right it was like why why didn't we get ones that were in the lab and the, like you know temperature humidity and then like features of the robot dinosaur like yeah, actually, Lita yeah. was so interested Weather in it. Weather conditions, the light conditions outside. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I was I was yeah. telling Lita about the paper after, and she was so interested. She read it afterwards, too. And she came back, she's like, she had the same questions we did. She said, well, what about this thing? What about this thing? And it's, again, it's a sign that, like, there's something interesting yep. here. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. just, you just want it a little bit deeper. And I think that's one of the cool parts about our crossovers, is that we both, from different perspectives, like, well, what about this thing? What about this thing? What about this kind of control? And, like... Like how you pointed out, like what was even the species of baboon that we were looking at here? Because exactly, yeah, the life history of the animals. Golgonak mentioned what the social structure normally is of these creatures, and 
it's I still think it's interesting, but I would have liked to have seen a lot better, and especially how they communicated their finding, because this figure, yeah, if you just go to this figure, you'd be like, humans? That's great. But that <laughs> was not, there was no human data in this study. Yep. Yeah. And I, again, I wonder if they snuck by because of the, the tier journal that it was in. That it like the reviewers didn't push back harder on it because this is a lower tier journal for like the figures you know i don't yeah, i don't know yeah, yeah. i don't know if that's uh -huh. something that i mean i i've had i've given reviews where i've given suggestions on the figures to like very specialty mm -hmm. journals and they were just like yeah this is for copy editors it's not for the reviewers so we're going to remove this part of your review oh wow which i was huh. which i was surprised by i was like i wasn't trying to like I just, yeah. you know, it was, like, hard to interpret the data. So, uh -huh. like, I feel like, you know, this kind of figure would be better. But it was, I'm like, I've never been met with a no before on that. So maybe that's kind of what it was. Interesting. Yeah. Jeez. Um, see, Harris says, are they, does that make it a good paper or a badly done paper? That's the question. I, th I think it's a good question. The scientific question. I think the starting approach is decent. And then it's just it's just too too bare too barren. I I, I want more to learn about yeah. here and like what other factors are important because I just I just don't know. And you know enough to say like how how big of a paper is this? How much of a game changer is this going to be? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's just a lot of extra things that could be at play here. And Smay actually they the confounding variables like chat right now is doing a such a better job on confounding variables which i mean hats off to y'all right like a lot of y'all are from danny's stream shows professor anduza has done an amazing job with his streams of like because it's, it's a different kind of thinking right it's like being critical yeah. about these papers and asking about like variables and how you would design an experiment like that's all it is to be a scientist in my mind is like the way you ask questions right like you don't have to have a degree to ask questions and like have being able to ask these kind of questions. It's just a lot of us just don't have access to that. Like I, I had, I didn't know how to ask these questions. If I didn't have my mentor who was a postdoc teach me how to ask these questions, I would never have made it as a scientist in any lab. Right. So I think it's just how you ask those questions. And then secondary is like, you have access being to like you know reagents and to be able to then do the questions in the lab but until then it's if you don't know how to ask you don't know and so like hats off Golganak pointing out social status is important to their overall health and that can contribute to fetal health and it might be important too and you know i, I think it's it just hats off to y'all of like of what danny's cultivated on twitch so thank you sir likewise balint holy cow <laughs> yeah yeah it's so yeah I, again i thought it was a cool paper a lot left to be desired um and then a lot of miscommunication on the public output front yep i'd like to, to have seen more baboon discussion you know give the baboons their due they gave a lot for this study let's acknowledge them you know you know that's actually <laughs> i thought it was really strange in the acknowledgments they did not mention the baboons there and i know this is a weird aside but i know but do I, primates normally get mentioned by name as as contributors to a study not by name but i've seen a new trend well actually maybe like yeah five or ten years now where like these higher tier yeah. papers in the acknowledgements thank the not by name but just like we thank the primates for giving their lives or something like it, it's a really heartfelt yeah. kind of thank you for something so higher order yeah yeah and so I, I was just kind of i i know it's a silly little detail but i was like oh that's kind of weird that that's I, not in here i've even seen that in in some like lower tier journals that like some of my colleagues have published in where like they just have a like a brief aside in the acknowledgements that like the the reviewers never i guess they didn't look at the acknowledgements but it's like we wish to acknowledge like these duck dinosaurs who gave their lives for the purpose of science you know 80 million years ago <laughs> it's a nice i think it's nice especially if you're working with a living like creature that had to give yeah. its life or i don't you know they didn't mention any death rates here so i'm assuming that there weren't but still uh -huh. you're 
you know, an animal is undergoing either obesity or not, and then there's these C-section, you know, it's still a stressor on the animal, so it's, um... For sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, Harissa, I'm not saying, there were not deaths amongst the baby baboons here, but just, like, that there was study on these creatures, and I just, I kind of, maybe, maybe it's, like, you know, a little, I, I like it. It's like, Danny, have you seen that, um, statue in Russia of the, uh, the mouse... Like that's knitting oh, the no. DNA? No, 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 I haven't. Let me... Show me. Oh, this sounds cool. This is I a... thought you meant the Laika statue, because there's a statue to Laika, the, the space dog, as well. I think there's several statues of her. Uh, here it is. It's a monument to a laboratory mouse. Uh-huh. Out of the Institute of Cytology and Genetics at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Oh, cool. And... So here is the image. Let me. I have up. seen this. Yeah. Where That's really this cool, before? right? Yeah, that is really cool. It's, it's like they're you know almost it's a it's meant to be thanking the animals for what they've contributed to the sciences, and it's, I mean you know you can argue how much of it is for show or not, but I think the sentiment behind it is pretty beautiful. I think it is too. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, yeah. yeah. Can you can maybe look up the Laika statue as well? Yeah. L a i k a. Um, because I think it's in a kind of a similar vein, where I don't. Know, I remember when I had a, a a stream about Sputnik. We were talking about the space program there and like how this dog, you know, was the first vertebrate animal to go up into space, and a lot of people in chat were really sad for her. Like, yeah, well, she, did, she didn't come back. It's true. But here she is, honored in statues and on postage stamps and in song lyrics and documentaries. And, you know, she was a stray dog, like, on the streets of Moscow not too long before she was sent up in that, in that spacecraft. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's always sad when, when an animal dies before its time. But... It's really cool that, you know, she could be honored like this. Just like those those lab mice. Yeah. Especially, statue. like, a, a dog, right? It, like, hits even closer home, right? Yeah. And it's just the fact that we remember. Yep. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of importance to that. And it's just, I think that kind of ties into the importance of having, like, these regulations in place of how to take care of the animals as well. And, like, animal care, yeah. which wasn't maybe a thing in the 60s. Or as more of a wild yeah. west is now more and more. I know that's not an issue in paleontology directly with the fossils, but when we talk about like the translation, right, from bird labs, what you would get to infer into the dinosaurs, right? Like sure. you again, it's all coming into play, and I think it's the importance of like you know paying attention to and remembering. Like we're in mm -hmm. a privileged position, and these animals are here helping us. You know, yeah. not always by Absolutely. choice. Yeah. Yeah. Some tears from that thank you. <laughs> No monument to ants yet, but there um, there's lots of books for like fruit flies and zebra fish, like kind of you know highlighting that without them there wouldn't have been these like big discoveries as well. So there's movement for at least more appreciation of them. But then we kind of jump back into what, what we were this? talking about earlier. A center for ants. Which is like, you know, um, the public communication of it, right? Of like the worthiness almost of like, oh, it's just a bug. Why are we studying a bug? And it's just, it kind of comes down to that like public perception again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny too, like how that, that doesn't always drive with the phylogeny as well as you think it would. Like you're talking about how, you know, it hits harder when it's a dog like Laika, but rats and mice are much more closely related to us as humans than dogs or, or cats are if dogs and cats are carnivorous mammals they're you know if you look back at, at ones and we're much closer to to glyries to to rodents and their relatives um like rodents are the closest living relatives of primates um so yeah yeah uh, at least in terms of major groups i guess tree shrews are, are closer to primates but you know what i mean yeah yeah that, that we like will yeah. actively be 
studying and gaining information from yeah and it's uh-huh it yeah there's something about dogs and cats man it's like don't touch our dogs and cats yep agreed but yeah it's yeah. it's all perception and eventually you start to value the you know i know like um Lita would always like even with dissecting fruit fly larvae it would be like minimizing the pain of that animal when doing that dissection too and not doing it yeah. for the sake of dissecting but rather because we needed to to answer a particular question and i think it's a good yep. mindset to have regardless of what you're studying i agree yeah and some of us can't even really handle that much and so we study fossils creatures that died tens of millions of years ago because we're i don't know i had such difficulty with dissections and stuff like that and like comparative vertebrate anatomy and i i just don't have the heart to cut up critters yeah um, I, I couldn't they've already been dead for tens of millions of years you know i mean i couldn't go yeah. to mammals i i knew very early on I'm like i cannot do mammals i know they're important to study yeah i cannot do it and hats yeah. off to the people who can and they they say you know you get used to it i'm like i don't think i would i don't think i would get used to that or i don't also i don't want to yeah. get used to it from a personal level uh-huh yeah and south rebel thank you for the bit welcome in um so danny what's uh should we wrap up this paper and move on what time do you have to go sir i don't want to keep you too long i should probably go in the next hour or so okay um yeah yeah should we do the uh, the dinosaurs from the subcontinent paper? Yes. This paper. Nice. Yeah. Whoops, I just turned my monitor off. Get that going again. I... Please tell, tell us... Oh my god, I have so many questions already about this paper. Yeah! Um, just give you like a, a brief background on... Yes. Please. Yeah. Because I know... So, so little about like the indian dinos what is the state of fossil science there why has it been like this state and what do you like why is this exciting like yeah oh man there's a bunch of let me get started holy cow so <laughs> india is a really really special place not just today but also going back into the ancient past so during the the mesozoic era the time of the dinosaurs by the time the first dinosaurs are evolving here on Earth, um, all of the Earth's continents are all squished together into this one massive supercontinent called Pangaea. All the land masses are just like puzzle pieces. You know, you've got South America and Africa. That's why they look like they fit together like puzzle pieces, is because they do. They used to be stuck together, chat. And um, India used to be way down, stuck next to. Uh, I guess the east coast of South Africa, the southern African continent right there. India was like nestled in there, um, in sort of stuck between Africa, Australia, Antarctica, and Madagascar, just kind of wedged in there. And then when the continents break apart, India is stuck next to Madagascar, and then it breaks away. And for a big part of the age of dinosaurs, India becomes this island continent. And it's just kind of drifting northward, and eventually, during the age of mammals, after the asteroid hits, eventually, I don't know, maybe it was like 10 million years ago, 20 million years ago, something like that, eventually crashes into Asia. And that's what pushes up the Himalayan mountains, which are still rising to this day. Mount Everest today exists because India crashed into mainland Asia. But that's not where it came from. It used to be stuck way down south. India used to be a southern continent. But anyway, as India breaks away and becomes this island continent unto itself, it develops what we think is probably a pretty unique assemblage of dinosaurs, unlike nowhere else on Earth. Um, but they're still very mysterious. We don't know a whole lot about the dinosaurs that lived in India at the time, because historically, paleontology has not been a well-funded science in India. And uh, it was the, the few dinosaurs that we do have from India were mostly collected by like, you know, British people during the Raj back when, you know, India was subject to the queen and all that. Um, and those fossils tended to be pretty fragmentary. They weren't super well studied at the time. Um, many of them were held in facilities where, 
you know, there weren't the funds to really preserve these fossils. And so some of them are lost or fell apart or... So anyway, this paper is kind of reevaluating the fossils of some smaller meat-eating dinosaurs that were dug up in India sometimes like a century or two ago. And, uh, and trying to figure out where do those fossils actually fit with our modern understanding of dinosaurs. Um, and so this is, I picked this paper blip for a number of reasons, but one of them is that this is really cool, like basic level dinosaur paleontology happening where it's not super flashy. It's not going out and finding new specimens, you know, out in exotic deserts or anything. It's like going back and revisiting these specimens on old rickety shelves in, in museums in India and studying them properly, reevaluating them. Uh, trying to preserve them and like there's parts in this paper where it's like yeah this was in a dozen pieces and we with permission of the museum in India we were able to glue this back together and restore it stuff like that and by all means Indian dinosaur paleontology should be a new frontier in the 21st century you know there are really cool fossils of dinosaurs to be found in India we I, w I would love to see that happen. I would love for India to be the new hot place for dinosaur fossils in this century. And I think this paper is a step in that direction. I, I like that intro a lot because I had a lot of questions on just what we might think dinosaurs, how they may have evolved when like going off on an island, essentially, right? Because island genetics yeah. are really cool. Just in, oh, yeah. in general. Evolution and isolation. Yeah, yeah but like uh, an island as big as India right yeah. where there's like it's not just a small island where there's like a singular ecosystem it's like you have tons of ecosystems on there and yeah. you can study island biogeography and evolution on a scale that's never been done before uh -huh. when looking at the dinosaurs and so i thought that was one of the really cool components of that is like going back and thinking about it in that uh -huh. kind of context and doing yeah. the reevaluations, I think, will, could be really powerful. One one question I have for you right off the bat, though, and this is just yeah. about fossil science of how you, you you've been teaching us, uh -huh. is and the same thing when you like you mentioned about like the colonizers coming over, is the importance of logging where you find that sample, where in the strata. Incredibly important. Like you mentioned, like remember, yeah. in, um, I think it was last week you were telling us about like there's uh, farmers in China who might uh -huh. look and just like take these fossils and try to sell it for money, but you've lost a bunch of information. What yep. is the state yep. of of these samples like for that? Like, have we lost where in the strata or location data, and we're just kind of going on the cranium and trying to identify like what's a dinosaur and what's not minus that info, or like what do we have? in re That's a great system. question. Yeah, yeah. In India in particular, um, it's it's not pretty oftentimes um, because uh, like a lot of these fossils were dug up in the 1800s. And sometimes the original localities where they're from, even if they've been recorded properly, those original localities can't be relocated nowadays. Like they can't be studied because so many of these... Uh, you know, like sandstone gullies or like a little, you know, canyon of bare exposed rock. So many of these places in India have just been turned into garbage dumps. Mm -hmm. So like literally they've just become the rubbish tip for the local village or the local city that's grown because that might not be an area that you can farm and there might not be trees or anything. So like, it's like oh, it's just rock, just fill it in with garbage. Um, and so like a lot of these classic fossil localities are today they're literally trash heaps. Um, I don't know if that's true of any of these particular fossils from this paper, but that is an issue that I've heard about in India, for sure. Yeah, because there was this map here that they provided. And uh -huh. so, like, one yeah. thing I, I, I was wondering was, like, what, you know, how... Is this, like, a current map? Is it taking into account what the data had been at that point in time and tying it together? I think it's a current day map in that sense yeah yeah um, so it, like there's been more extensive study of the geology nowadays uh, gotcha and it's like yeah, I, I India, guess it would be hard to go back and talk about like what where these samples were found like you uh -huh. said because the 
even if we have like still like not rubbish dumps and it's just like forest or something presumably over the course of 200 years has changed yeah definitely and, 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 and india definitely provides challenges in that sense kind of like the east coast like new jersey does blue where like <laughs> You get rain and you get a lot of plants, and it's like you don't have this these beautiful, extensive badlands of exposed rock everywhere. Um, so instead, you got to be a little bit more. Uh, it requires more work to be able to find fossils in the first place. So at one point in the paper, they talk about one of these fossil localities where the fossils were actually found by like tilling up dirt in a farmer's field. Um, and you just have stuff that kind of erodes up to the surface hmm. and that's how they find these fragments of bones like that. It's very different from the kinds of environments that that I work, the, the localities that I work in in like Utah or Wyoming or, or Montana um, that yeah. definitely provides its own challenges in that respect. There was a question from Celtic Elephant about because India is like rainforest, plains acidic mm -hmm. soil, could that contribute to decreased fossils in that area? Certainly. Yeah, for sure. Um, just the vegetation, for one. Like, it makes it much harder to find fossils if you can't just walk along beautiful exposures of, of bare rock. Um, but yeah, yeah, and the acidity of the soil might have something to do with that as well, where you just might have faster erosion. Um, yeah, but the bigger factor is really going to be that you just have more plants everywhere. And that makes it tougher to find fossils, for sure. Partly Excellent. because those plants are breaking down sedimentary rock and turning it into soil. We don't find fossils in soil. We find fossils in rock. Yeah. So finding exposed rock is tricky sometimes in a place like India. More so than in other places like the, that are drier. Does India. that make inherent fossilization, the beginning stages of that, also harder to happen? Um... Not really. I mean, that was so long ago at this point. So, like, more than 66 million years ago that, like, yeah. I don't know. Fossils don't don't really form on forest floors, mm -hmm. for the most part. They form in environments where you get bones buried under sediment. So it'll be in a stream channel, or at the bottom of a river, or the bottom of a lake, in a swamp. Some place like that where you can get layers of sediment that, that cover bones. Uh, that's where you get dinosaurs preserved. If you had a dinosaur that died on a forest floor and, you know, you, there's no no real shot that's going to turn into a fossil. Like, gotcha. those bones are going to decay just because, you know, everything gets, like, resorbed, recycled in a forest, you know? Um, you get fungi and decomposers and stuff like that that are just, like, working to break all that stuff down. You got to get... The magic ingredient really is burial. It's got to be buried in sediment before it can actually become a fossil. And presumably, as Sparky said, uh, like the the fossils, like if if there's like a root system as well, like that could also yeah. further destroy. Shoot, that it. happens today. Um, after fossils have already been preserved and they've survived for tens of millions of years, sometimes you get like a a really nasty bit of sagebrush that just decides to grow in the middle of a dinosaur bone, and the roots go through it in search of nutrients and then they just like break up the bone from the inside really and so sometimes in the field oh yeah i found so many different dinosaur bones bullet where they're just turned to powder by modern plants like plants today just bones provide like a really convenient place for them to get nutrients it's like a place that water collects during rainstorms it just plants love to seek out bones and if you're lucky They'll just kind of coat the surface of the bone with their little root tendrils. So just get this like soft little felt carpet of rootlets over the, the surface of a bone. But sometimes they find their way into the bone and they just break it up from the inside. And that's really aggravating. But it happens a lot. Wow. I Yeah. Even is do you find it in the Badlands too, like that, where it's not Oh yeah. Like, I'm talking about in the Badlands oh, here. Gotcha. In Wyoming and Montana and Utah, yeah. So presumably yeah. here and on already more you know tropical rainforesty yeah. environment you're gonna have difficulty so the fossils that they have found right are all the more important to categorize and preserve and restore because you're probably already at a negative starting point in terms of the exactly. likelihood of survival that's a really cool yeah. way to think about it is like it kind of reminds you of that study that we talked about a few weeks ago with like africa uh -huh. Right, that we were yeah. talking about, like the taking ownership of the data, 
and like pulling uh-huh. in the locals for that and like giving them like the authority to to work on it. it almost yeah. feels like this study is similar in that like it's wanting to start up uh, i think it is yeah so the the last author of this paper jeff wilson he's a researcher who works on sauropod dinosaurs he's from the university of michigan um his brother actually works on fossil mammals greg wilson um, oh, that's cool. They're, they're, a, fun, they're, they're a, a funny pair. pair. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I bet the dinner table <laughs> conversation. Yeah, delightfully like, disparaging things to say about one another. It's it's pretty funny. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, anyway, so they're both professional vertebrate paleontologists. But anyway, so Jeff Wilson is kind of like the. Uh, he's got the facility at the University of Michigan, and he's got funding and stuff like that. And then there are these researchers, I think, in India, uh, like in the country of India itself, and they did a collaboration with Jeff Wilson, and they shipped him fossils and stuff like that for him to be able to study there. And actually, I don't know exactly who was where. It could have been that some of these scientists with, um, like, uh, Indian-sounding surnames, maybe they're already at the University of Michigan or something. I don't actually know. But it's really cool that there could be this international cooperation like that where, I don't know, it, it points in the paper, they said, yeah, well, here's our methods are, these fossils were brought from India to Michigan. They were scanned, CT scanned, photographed, you know, studied, sometimes repaired um, or prepared. Like there were bits of rock that were, that were prepped off of them. And then there were casts made. So they made exact replicas of the original fossil bones to keep in Michigan. And then they sent the originals back to India. Where's where my drink? Walked. So this could be like a, a really nice, uh, I don't know, kind of a pilot program maybe for future studies like this. I guess um, we when we talked about like the changes brought to Africa as well, we talked about maybe the loss or lack of presence of museums. Uh-huh. And like having museums would really help that further that ownership of like a, a pride and the unique features that are available for that country. So I, I would hope that there is like, that future like investment coming in to one million percent yeah yeah because uh, there were a bunch of i think several different institutions that these fossils were from in the paper there's no like central museum in india for for fossils they don't have like a smithsonian or something like that for fossils there's like a bunch of different universities that might have little museums and from what i understand it might just be like a closet somewhere with some rickety shelves that these fossils have been on and like stuff gets lost and stuff gets destroyed by you know by humidity or like things crumble over time and it's it's kind of crazy to think about because india is becoming like you know they're on the verge of becoming like a global superpower i guess and like there's there's so many cool things coming out of india and yet their dinosaur science it's not well funded even though certain dinosaurs from india like rajasaurus are becoming super super popular in that country and there are like theme park rides and movies and stuff about it in india and like so you've got tremendous public enthusiasm for indian dinosaurs but you don't have the funding to properly maintain and preserve these important indian dinosaur fossils yet it's it's kind of nuts. It's it's weird to think about like that. It, it's at least hopeful that there's this public support for it. You know, like that's a really yeah. cool element to it. Um, like we uh-huh. were talking about, like with like the African dinosaurs, there was the same kind of push to be able uh-huh. to have some of that. And I think you know that this is a singular country. Maybe hopefully makes it a little bit easier to have some kind of uh-huh. centralized museum. You yeah. know. But even even then, like I know there's huge differences in northern and southern India and like the locales yeah, sure. there too. Yeah. But I don't know. It provides like a lot of hope for it because like we talked about, there's so much. Like when you intro the topic of India as a location uh-huh. to look at for dinosaurs, incredibly exciting, right? Yeah, like so cool and, and interesting. Yeah, and, and just like it, it's wild to me of how recent really it crashed into Asia. Yeah. Right, uh-huh. because of like, just you can just imagine like all, other creatures too, and the evolution of them and how it was driven on that like 
island. Yep. Giant island, basically. What crossed over when there was, you know, when they were together. And uh -huh. afterwards, what happened? Like, when they got separated and, like, you can track the evolution or, like, speciation events yep. between the two. And it yeah. would be really cool to be able to see that. Like extra and bit that, of that should be such a like a source of, of national pride. Yeah, for the people of India and like it has a real potential for that. Like India has things that no other country in the world has, and like there's also tremendous opportunities for for tourism and for you know anytime you've got something that's unique like that, a country can really use that to its advantage and and can can use that to to further science education. For their people like they've got a wonderful opportunity here and um yeah i really i really hope that gets seized um because i don't know india is such a special place and they've got such special fossils and they've got the potential for like for dinosaurs that nowhere else in the world do we have anything close to that there's stuff you know underneath the ground there in india there are fossils waiting to be found that are going to blow everybody's minds just really hope that you know that they get found you know so is that a i know we're rabbit holing a little bit but is that a dream site that you would like to dig at like if you had the opportunity oh, to sure. leave the theater field site oh yeah oh yeah i've wanted to go to india for a long time oh and hello sweetie pie <laughs> we're having a, a feline visit here we got oh. a double because socks is back in frame <laughs> Oh, and Sweetie Pie's got her own socks here. <laughs> She's got those little, you know, little bits of white on all four of her paws. Um, I'm sorry, what were we saying? Um, oh, going to India. My, my dad has been to India, um, I think a couple of times. Um, one time he actually did an auto rickshaw race. So you know, do you know what a tuk-tuk is, Belint? Yes, yes. Yeah, so he did a nationwide tuk-tuk race for a, a company that he, uh, he used to work with. Um, where they did this as like a publicity stunt, basically. But him and uh, like a motocross guy, they were a team, and they, uh, they went all across India. And uh, they, came, they came in second place, which was really impressive, I think, out of a team. I don't know how many teams. Wow. But anyway, he just told me, he's, he comes back, he's like, Mijo, you'd, you'd really, really like to... <laughs> I think you'd like India a lot. You should really go. And so someday I'd like to be able to go. And um, I think that would be really, really cool. So what I should really get in contact with um, with Jeff Wilson at the University of Michigan. I should talk to him about this because, yeah, that could be – I could actually make that happen. And the wonderful thing about India as well, well, and I've been told, is that – it could be a very hospitable place for, for a vegetarian like me. Because <laughs> so much of the, the population uh, doesn't eat meat. So, you know, if I were going to Mongolia or something, like, everything is everything is meat. You know, like, they don't have vegetables there. But, uh, but India, you know, it's easy for a vegetarian to get by. So, well, and uh, the nice thing is, it's not just vegetarian uh -huh. for the sake of vegetarian, but it's well-thought-out foods with the flavors oh, yeah. going together versus just like here at Applebee's here's a head of lettuce for you vegetarians <laughs> exactly yeah I think it was an onion article it was like <laughs> vegetarian option at local diner is just head of lettuce on white bread or something so yeah. Lita when I guess this was like when she was an undergrad they that's what they actually like get, brought her out was a head of lettuce they were like this is our option because it was like they had a oh, salad boy. but it had bacon on it and she's like, so can I get it without the bacon and dressing on the side? And they just brought it. Here's lettuce, and here's a thing of dressing. <laughs> I can relate. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, I, I oh, guess boy. I have a one of my best friends is vegetarian, and he was, uh, when he was interviewing at Emory, he got a, uh -huh. a thing of chicken. <laughs> as is the vegetarian yeah. option. They used to happen in Montana all the time. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, do you? You know, I'm not really, because you can't say the V word there in certain parts of Montana, or they'll they'll run you out on a rail. But um, <laughs> say like, you know, can I, you know, what what do you have that's you know not not really meat heavy? I just I don't know if I'm feeling like a meat heavy dish today. I'm like, well, there's the chicken, or you could have the pork, 
or the venison. <laughs> <laughs> to the to them, meat just means beef. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get the, the venison is just such a random option. Yeah, that or goat. I've also heard goat is the vegetarian option. What? You know? So, well, I, yeah, yeah. I, I guess they ate cans, so I, you know, it's... <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. so, like, for you on this paper, uh, I, uh, uh -huh. what is your what is your favorite part? Because I really liked these, the topography yeah, slices that they did, like, the computer simulation. Uh, I thought I think these this were... was their new jawbone that they had, by the way. The um, what? Which also, I, uh, I found their restraint very impressive here. Let me, let me pull up the paper and make sure I'm I've got this right. What do you mean but, by res uh, by restraints? So in this paper, uh, they described a new jawbone of a theropod dinosaur from India. And a lot of other paleontologists would just absolutely have, if they found like, oh, holy cow, a fragment of a jawbone from a dinosaur in India, wow, that's a new genus and a new species right there. We're going to give this thing a name based on a single fragment with no teeth from a jaw. And they didn't do that here. Okay. So that, that might seem like a low bar to clear, but they did not name it. Well, well, and that's that's a huge deal. Sorry, when we, when we said topography and you said restraints, my head went to the sample restraint on how to like get the image. I was like, oh, what do you mean? And no. <laughs> not, even, not even that specific. Just they... They had this cool new material, and uh, and I believe, yeah, they just call it Noasaurid Indeterminate. Um, yeah, yeah, and so this is the problem. Like a big part of what they're trying to correct in this paper is that researchers back in the 1800s were naming these different dinosaurs based on the tiniest little scraps. Um, and in one point, they had like I think three different vertebrae from a, a theropod dinosaur. And they say in the paper, it, it was funny how they were, uh, they said this very kindly, but they're they're like, oh, what were previously attributed to, uh, to phylogenetic differences were actually just like differences of the vertebrae in the, uh, was it in the, in the axial column? So it's like they had a neck vertebra, a back vertebra and a tail vertebra, probably from the same animal. And they gave these, three different names. They're like, look how different these vertebrae look. It's like, yeah, they look different with <laughs> different parts of the body. This is what dinosaur paleontology was like back in the 1800s, especially with, I don't know, India was back then very much a backwater in, in terms of fossil science. And so you didn't have like uh, the best and brightest paleontologists of the day working on this stuff. It was people who were like, know colonial overseers or whatever or like you know british officers who were stationed in india who liked to like hunting fossils at the time that kind of thing and they'd name these things and they just yeah so it, it's created like big taxonomic messes for us to clean up and that's part of what this paper is doing is cleaning up those messes and trying to be a little bit more uh intelligent about about not naming things based on scraps like here does that so make sense? You've mentioned that 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 was I mean that just wasn't just here, right? That that was a phenomenon for a while. Oh yeah. And, and like yeah, like all a, a global issue and we talked about like how you like what side of the pendulum you're on for like yeah. how conservative like how likely <laughs> it would be to name one versus like others, right? Where it's just like this yeah. it, it might not be a, a a mini version or a younger version like let's just dump this and make this a new species with Yep. With the, I thought the vertebrae were really interesting because I can, the way you see, it's just the way you said, you're like, of course they're different. They're from different parts of the body. But so from, uh -huh. for my naive question is how can you tell if you go uh -huh. back to it that this is, yeah. might actually be part of the same animal because they are from different parts of the, of the body. It's like, how can you piece together the vertebra from one animal versus another and delineate that it's a different species or not and i know for you this might be like well, this is basic but like this is really cool and like how does one do that so that's what you're asking is an excellent question and it, it kind of gets into the heart of this paper too 
Um, a lot of these dinosaurs that were named from the 1800s from India way back in the day, this is before we really knew anything about dinosaurs. So like one of these, um, toward the beginning of the paper, was named in like 1830 or something like that. That's before the word dinosaur even existed. So like this is from the very, very beginnings of, of dinosaur science. Yeah, um, 1842? Uh, 1842 is when the word dinosaur was coined. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, the, the first first sentence in the introduction there. Yeah. Uh, the first reported discovery of dinosaur bones from the Indian subcontinent dates back to 1828, when British Army Captain W.H. Sleeman recovered caudal vertebrae with a notable ball and socket joint from the upper Cretaceous sediments uh, of Jubalpur. There you go. Uh, at the name, at the time, the name dinosaur had not yet been coined. So this is from like the very beginnings of dinosaur science before anybody really knew anything about dinosaurs. Like this is from the very birth of this field, and so different bones got different names at the time and stuff like that. But nowadays we can compare these if we find them again, like these authors did. Mm -hmm. If you go back and find these original specimens, you can interpret them in the light of what we know today. So now we have a really good sense for what neck vertebrae should look like in small meat-eating dinosaurs versus back vertebrae versus tail vertebrae. Like, we've got a good search image for all this stuff. Like, we understand this stuff at such a higher level than anybody did back then that it makes it really easy to reinterpret these old finds and be able to figure out what's really going on with them. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why this paper was so exciting to me is that so often in, in paleontology, that old stuff kind of gets neglected. Um, and here, they're reinterpreting those old fossils, and they're like really doing their homework and and trying to, to trying to like kind of make good on those old finds and and recontextualize them in the light of what we know today. So when you're finding like vertebrae, uh -huh. are you doing then homology? Like here is what we know about vertebra in dinosaurs. Yeah. Let's try to find uh -huh. a, a closest match to interpret what might this be a part of. Like, maybe it's a new species, but yep. is that how you would interpret it's a small meeting, eating dinosaur because the structure of this vertebra looks like this existing? Yeah. Okay. Yep. See, that's, that's amazing we, we, that you can get that information from a vertebra. Oh, hmm. that's the... That's, that's so simple, Bullet. That's, that's nothing. <laughs> I get amazed. That's that what we do, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the, the vertebrae, they change so much in different groups of dinosaurs that, like, you can narrow it down to a at least a family level, usually, if not, like, a genus level, just wow. looking at a vertebra. Um, yeah, it's... If you get to know your osteology, it's... Um, yeah, like, there are people who can look at a, a single, you know, neural arch of a vertebra, just, like, the top part that the spinal cord runs under, and... And you could say, oh yeah, well this is definitely from uh, this is from a non hadrosaur hadrosaur form, just based on something like that. Um, and it, it's yeah, that's what so much of vertebrate paleontology is is just looking at you know, what seem to be really what might appear to be really small fragments of bone but they're really informative. And you go, oh yeah I've seen this in this group, in that group, and we can narrow it down and we say it's part of this family right here just based on that and that's how you link together three distinct looking vertebra pieces into sure. one I think species in that case, uh there were probably some notes originally like in that old publication that said that these were collected from the same site and it's like oh if they were collected from the same site there's a pretty high likelihood it's all from the same animal um, gotcha gotcha i think that's what happened in that particular case yeah so they had to do a lot of digging right like there is like older like uh -huh. the original notes and data sets like that's really cool that there was so much yeah. going in to reinterpret this data because it's i i think where i got hung up on is how we talked about last week or maybe the week before about like the sedimentary layer and how much information you lose when you remove it from a site like you were when people in chat were yeah. like well what do i do if i find a dinosaur bone right do i just dig it up and bring it to you and you said no just like leave it like take the leave take the location place. And then, yeah. and then we move Take on. Take a GPS reading. Together, we can move the GPS galaxy. Reading, email it to, to a paleontologist locally, yeah. yeah. And uh, California um, Burbs just California subscribed Burbs. for 21 months. 
Balance nice. shirt, 100 points. <laughs> Danny's shirt, May. Professor Burbs. Much more colorful shirt on Blit there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's from Celestial Beanar. We, you got to meet her at TwitchCon. Uh, oh, yeah, cool. she was at the panel. Hello there. Uh, hello, nice. Clark. California Burbs, thank you for the resub. We'll add your resub to the raw science speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Burbs. How's it going? Thank you again. Guys, we shout out California Burbs at the start of every stream. Go drop them a follow. They are my most viewed stream last year. I think I spent like some absurd thousands of hours because it's just so chill. And Munchkin loves yeah. sleeping to just like the sound of the birds. I'm like, all right, that's what we're always the there. There too, yeah. Yeah, wow. and then there, nice. there's a lot of turkeys. There have been absurd number of oh. turkeys that like popped up on. Oh, very cool. <laughs> Which I mean, I was always getting a chuckle. They were. It looked like they were chasing uh, Professor Burbs around. <laughs> <laughs> and hi, JD. Welcome on in. JD does that. How's it going? Um. So what was uh? I guess back to this paper. What is yeah. Your most surprising piece in here in this reevaluation. Were you surprised by anything in terms of like the range of dinosaurs or the technique or or is it just like a very I, just like I appreciate this paper for what it is versus like anything really like groundbreaking? Uh I don't know if there's anything super groundbreaking about it, but it was really cool. I don't know. I just appreciate on kind of a personal level as a non-splitter in the lumpers and splitters thing that they didn't choose to like name that new jawbone and also just some of these different dinosaur names i've been reading about since i was a little kid okay like jubbled puria and um and lamidosaurus and uh there were some other ones too like velocisaurus and stuff like that um Levisuchus, indicus etc you hear these names kind of floating around they're obscure, obscure, obscure things that were published a long, long time ago. But it's always like, oh yeah, it's just some kind of... We don't really know what this dinosaur was. And here, they're actually able to say, yeah, these are probably Noasaurids and Abelosaurs. Which are... That's, uh, those are two groups of meat-eating dinosaurs, mostly from the southern continents. From places like South America, Australia, um, and Madagascar. And so kind of like meeting these dinosaurs again in adulthood and going like, oh yeah you're an abelisaur or you're a noasaurid suddenly they make a lot more sense um, and that is really really cool to me that just like being able to to take something that was once so mysterious and make a little bit of sense out of it like that it's no longer something that's just like, oh yeah, there's this name with this really scrappy bone and like, who knows what it is. It's like, no, it it starts to actually come together. It's this group of like, cool dinosaurs from the, you know, from Gondwana, from the southern continents. And like, of course it's there. That makes all the sense in the world, you know? And so when you were a kid, did we not uh -huh. know really anything about these dinosaurs beyond that there was a name? No. Yeah, it's just a name. And like, like oh yeah, it's some kind of small meat-eating dinosaur, probably. That was it. Okay. And, and now it's like we've got more tantalizing information. Like, oh, it's probably a, an abelisaur or a noasaurid. Suddenly it becomes more than just a name. It becomes part of a, a larger story. And that's part of what this paper was about, was like trying to figure out where these different groups originated. And some of them might actually originate in India. That might be where they first evolved. But we need more field work to be able to like find more remains of them and try and figure that out yeah so i think it's really cool how you said that it's a feature of the southern continents of yeah. some of these dinosaurs right because that's you're not used to thinking of, of india as being a southern continent right exactly right yeah. that it's it's telling it's yeah. tracing along the movement uh -huh. of the continent right as it was in that island state can you tell us anything Danny about do we know like given that knowledge of like the similarity to southern continent dinosaurs do we have any comparison to continental southern dinosaurs of like the fixed landmass that did not become an island like do we know 
existing uh-huh. differences between the two? Like, is that does that question make sense? Oh, it does. It definitely does. And I just give you a link there too. If you click that, hopefully it'll bring up the right time. But there you go. Yeah, there's India. <laughs> there as an island continent. This is uh, just before the end of the Cretaceous period, like when the asteroid hit. Wow. Um, okay, so this is like. Is that cool? That is so cool. Yeah. It's really and, weird uh, to think about. The... Isn't that cool? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Of you course, said that... I've been learning about this since I was a little kid, so this is the most natural thing in the world to me. But <laughs> I recognize that a lot of people in chat and YouTube, and this is probably pretty novel right now. But there it is. Yeah. And it has yeah. a huge implications for not just like dinosaur past, but like modern day evolution too, right? Like what sure. else has been stuck on here as it's floating wow. in the ocean and not and you know just like you said small maybe mammals um insects uh-huh. like a lot of things could really have evolved uniquely and i i mean it's just really cool and talks about like another reason why we need to study things on this continent um yeah but Lynn, i wonder if maybe the ants that exist today on in india and pakistan and sri lanka if they might have more similarity to the ants of madagascar or africa or Australia. They well, actually, Asia. yeah. So that remember we talked about that um, was the Australian uh-huh. connection because there's the ants in Australia and in India that can transition yeah. from worker to queen and back. Uh huh. Versus that's not really a European thing. Yeah, yeah. And so that I, I don't Makes I don't sense. know enough about like Africa, right? Like if if this splitting event, like what's in this region, and actually I don't even know uh-huh. if it's really known yeah but like that could be an evolutionary explanation of like the different types of organisms on these islands as, as because of the, how they split and that's really cool to think right. about yeah and so we have the same thing with dinosaurs where the the dinosaurs in india what little bits we have seem to to match pretty closely with dinosaurs from madagascar especially and south america and not so much australia yet but we need more fossils from australia they really match really well with uh, with Madagascar and South America and Africa too, to a certain extent. Um, you get these dinosaurs called the bellysaurs, and um, here I'll I'll see if I can pull up an image for you. Let's pull up a uh, Majungasaurus, um, which is uh, let's see, try and find you a decent image here. That's not too shabby. Yeah, here. Copy image address, and there you go. Um, so these are these cool meat-eating dinosaurs. They've got ridiculously short arms. They're barely even there. In fact, we're not totally sure if their arms were even, like, free. They might be, like, stuck to the side of the body. They might be, like, within the body wall. It's, like, totally vestigial. Probably not, but point. it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, but they seem to be vestigial. Like, they, they have no use for their arms anymore, it seems. Wow. Um... We've got dinosaurs like this from India and from Madagascar. Uh, this one is from Madagascar. This is Majungasaurus. Uh, Rajasaurus, like I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. the one that's really popular in India, looks just like this, basically. But it's from uh, but it's from India. And then we these guys are all over South America as well. And uh, we don't have them in North America. We don't have them in Asia. There might be a f- couple of them, maybe, from Europe. And then there's a few from Africa. Um but it's like these are quintessentially Cretaceous southern dinosaurs from Gondwana, you know, the remnants of the ancient supercontinent in the south. When Pangaea broke apart, it was Gondwana in the south and then Laurasia above. Laurasia was North America, Europe, and Asia. Gondwana was uh, South America, Africa, India, Madagascar, Australia, New Zealand, and Antarctica. Um, so yeah, yeah. So it, this this is a good example of like what we call endemism, maybe, or maybe this is I don't know, maybe it's not true endemism, but like uh, endemism is when you get like uh, you might already know what this is, Belen. No, please, but please, it, please. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's when you get different populations that evolve specially in in places in isolation. So like these dinosaurs are endemic to South America mm-hmm. and the other southern continents. They exist only there, really, and that's kind of their stronghold. Um, so the isolation for that is the southern, that southern yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. And then when uh-huh. the continent split, it's almost like it maintained that kind of isolation. 
and there, yeah. there might be yeah. differences in these animals, but like the base shape, like because yeah, they, they had a, they common, ancestor. a common ancestor. Yeah. So this is like the the abelosaur lineage, and then in North America, and and Asia, and presumably Europe too, uh, you've got tyrannosaurs that are kind of filling this niche there. So T. Rex and its relatives. They're doing their thing up north, and at the same time, these guys are kind of the Tyrannosaur equivalent for the south. And because they're geographically isolated, you know, the Tyrannosaurs in the north, Abelisaurs in the south, and... Yeah, it's it's cool to think about. So, Rajasaurus, which looks very similar to this, sometimes, because everything has to relate back to T-Rex in popular culture, <laughs> people call it the T-Rex of India. Um, India's T-Rex Rajasaurus. Uh, yeah. Is it a yeah. similar size to this one? It might be a little bit smaller. Let's look up Rajasaurus. The, the only reason I ask is because my my understanding is T Rex is larger than a. Oh yeah, yeah. Person, Tyrannosaurus right? is so, definitely so, larger. So like the imagery that you're getting of like India's T Rex. Uh huh. Isn't really correct, right? It, yeah, yeah. So here's a here's an image of. Rajasaurus with a person for scale. Whoops. Hang on, I don't think that went into the chat properly. Uh, let's see. Copy image address. No, hang on. Uh, I'm gonna open this new tab for. Sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, Google images. Um, Oh, that is a super, super long... Let me shorten this URL. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay, give that a try. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, uh, so not, not much. Ooh, and I like the colors. Are, are there any preserved? No. No, okay. No. Uh, not for these guys. So for Rajasaurus itself, there's uh, we've got a pretty decent skull of the animal. Um, here, I'll just show you the Wikipedia page, and then you can you can find that image with the skull. But uh, yeah, yeah. Oh wow! It's uh, it's a cool critter, like pretty well preserved. This is probably the best preserved dinosaur skull ever found in India. I mean, it it looks yeah. beautiful doesn't it yeah. yeah parts of it have been reconstructed so mm -hmm. that it's not all original there but the lead author on this paper was jeff wilson oh cool so he's been working there for a good while now and uh yeah yeah it's Is funny that... i worked with his brother greg wilson in montana years ago um but i've never actually worked with jeff wilson even though he's a dinosaur guy his brother's a mammal guy it's cool some like yeah. how the mammal field and the dino field kind of working together because you, like you said too like the yeah. like the mammals are these small puny rodents and like selecting for this uh -huh. fast gestation time and that could not be... even they were smaller than rodents like rodents hadn't even evolved yet they were like <laughs> little little shrew like things during the mesozoic for the most part yeah and then like yeah, how we had that talk about cool. like that bottlenecked into the aging and like maybe yeah. why how aging is affected because of that it's just really cool how all of it kind of it ties together yep. and you can't really just look at them yeah like absolutely in a, yeah in an yeah. insular way and it just it makes me really excited for, again for these crossovers because it's like whoa uh -huh. this is so cool <laughs> so yeah yeah so that's rajasaurus there which i don't think really comes up in this paper but it's a good example of uh this group of dinosaurs that they are very much southern dinosaurs and yet they're there in india because india was once a southern continent drifted its way north it's yeah. it's interesting too to think about how um madagascar is yeah. one is one of these components as well because it it uh-huh you know it's like it, it was it's kind of africa adjacent uh-huh but then it has like these features of India and Australia too, and it just kind of speaks again to how everything was that one continental southern plate. Because I know yep. with like fruit yep. fly biology, we study Madagascar because it has a couple of individuals where it's like, well, how did they get here and they shouldn't have been here? But uh -huh. it's like that speciation event that took place. Like there's um, 
Drosophila Murciana that's uh-huh. on Madagascar that's uh, particular for them and it's like that's a different speciation event that happened but like you can trace it back to like some of the landmass splitting but it's like new enough where it's not just that and so it, it's yep. just neat to see like all these different components like you know being bridged together mm-hmm. it's cool stuff yeah and, and again like a, an illustration of why India is so important and so interesting and and that yeah so what is yeah. there um i know danny we're, sh- we're running out of time with you my friend i don't want to obviously keep you too long i, I think we that, got like you. five yeah. five ten minutes at most or now when you tell me i can keep blabbing your ear off the yeah. entire night yeah. um i guess like final thoughts maybe on the importance of this study like i don't know you you said in the email you thought it might be a little bit dry and i i, I thought it was really cool to be able to go back and revisit like because I just know so little about Indian dinosaurs. Like, you, you said, like, as a kid, like... That's true of everybody, though. We, we don't know a lot about Indian dinosaurs in general. Well, well I didn't you know, know about Rogersaurs. Yeah. You know, like, that yeah, was... Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's, it's just really cool, like, how you as a kid knew about this and, like, how revisiting the paper, like, there was yeah. more... Like, I, I can't... That's such a cool feeling to be able to get. Like, I guess I had the opposite uh-huh. where revisiting plesiosaur the first time on your stream and finding out it's not a dinosaur <laughs> yeah yeah um, uh, yeah i guess final thoughts on the importance of this paper do you uh, like what would you say is like the the big important takeaways on this i really really hope that uh people in india who are in charge of things like science funding and stuff like that, I really hope that they sit up and take notice and that they they develop a, a kind of a pride in their dinosaur heritage because there are untold wonders to be found in India uh, in Indian dinosaur fossil fields I really really hope that this becomes a major national point of pride for the people of India because they've got so many cool dinosaurs that are just waiting to be dug up and studied and published and and paraded before the public. I uh, I hope that this paper helps usher in like a new golden age of of Indian dinosaur paleontology. That's that's what I'll say. Do you think it will? We talked about that one from uh, the the remember the citation study. Of like looking back yeah. at that database and that was kind of a, an attempted lightning rod to get more awareness to those databases and change the mindset and i i think our consensus yeah. at the end of that was well it probably it probably won't have as strong of an impact as we're hoping do you have any insight as to what you think the effect of this will be like is this a is this a big enough journal to make a splash or are we kind of just like hoping no this is this is my home journal. This is the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, which is like, that's our our society journal for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. It's not high profile. Gotcha. Um, but this is a cool paper, and it's it's really cool to see this kind of like basic level research being done and getting published. Um, I think really if there is a big change in how dinosaur paleontology is funded in India, it will not come through the journal front like this. It'll come through, like, I don't know. As I understand it, a lot of things in, in Indian politics are like, you just got to know the right people and make the right case and then make the right connections. And that's not, I don't think, what these researchers are trying to do. They're trying to do what researchers do. They're, you know, trying to do science. Mm-hmm. It'll take a concerted political effort, I think, to actually make a big change there. And hopefully somebody can do that. I don't think that's my place, certainly. I've never been to India yet, but it, um, it's interesting of how you were saying that they were able to take stuff out, put it back together, and bring it back. Because I know with we talked about yeah. this before with like ants and other creatures uh-huh. like that, you're it's illegal to take anything out of the country. Like if you want to work on it, it, has to be in the country, and you can't take anything out. So it's yeah because they want to right, protect the potential intellectual property of the country. So I, I wonder what right. direction it's the lower profile than that. Where it's like these are, are dusty fragments of bones on a probably a on a rickety shelf in a closet somewhere in an Indian university, 
You know, it's like this is gonna fly under the radar of customs and everything else. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. You know, this stuff should be high profile. This stuff should be a major point of national pride, and hopefully, someday it will be. Because I, for one, would love to see this. You know, the fossil wonders of of India published for for all the world to admire. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. That's. Oh God, it was so cool, Danny. It was so. Thank you so much for this paper. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I'm really glad you liked it. I was afraid it was going to be too, I don't know, arcane or or, or dusty. But I'm, I think I'm glad. it's I, I like how you illustrate it. Like again, it's not my field of expertise, but I think it's super important. And just like where my thinking is, is like a little bit in dabbling in evolutionary genetics is just like what happened with India, like as uh-huh. it was an island, <laughs> right? in terms of yeah. dinosaurs and your intro of like why this is important like was even more of an eye opener because i didn't uh-huh. realize that it was to to this point 65 66 million years ago it was still free floating like this right oh, yeah. so that's that's not yeah. only dinosaurs but like some tons of modern species like what you said 20 10 20 million years ago that it crashed in and started forming the himalayas like that I don't don't quote me on that. But, yeah. but, but even <laughs> but right, that's like relatively new, and so like yeah, how much yeah. has evolved and like how much how many secrets the country hold like it's just it's so cool. And I think like there's yeah, yeah there's nothing about this that this is boring. I think this is really exciting stuff. And, uh, and, just, and not just for dinosaurs either. I mean, we've been talking a lot about dinosaurs, but uh, the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, are already really well known currently for probably being the birthplace of whales oh. whales probably evolved there like as india is getting ready to crash into mainland asia mm-hmm. you've got this warm tropical sea there and the earliest fossil whales that we have are from there that's probably where whales first originated back when whales still had legs and they walked around. we were talking about this yesterday on my stream but um Pakistan is from pakistan uh indo is the the earliest uh, non-cetacean whale ancestor that we have. Um, that's from India. You get uh, Ambulocetus, the walking whale. That's literally what the name means. Um, that's from India, or from Pakistan, I forget. But uh, that part of the world is is already well known to paleontologists as the birthplace of whales. Um, and I think, I don't know how, how, I'm not a mammal guy, so I don't know how, how uh, how much people in India recognize that and how much national pride there is for that. But that's also really, really cool. India's got an incredible fossil heritage. and It'd be really... Mini Pie, don't drink that. Stop it. <laughs> um, that's my water. <laughs> does, but, does, she, uh, does she drink face first or does she do like noodle? She puts her paw in and she samples oh, like... She, she'll stick her nose in before she even realizes that it's drinkable. Lita know? will have, like, a cup of coffee out, and Noodle uh-huh. is like, huh, and puts her paw in and samples it, like, oh, I don't like this. But then she'll have, like, a little bit of cat litter <laughs> between her feet. So then Lita, like, looks and takes oh, a drink, no. but she's like, oh, no, there's floating cat litter. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so... It... Oh, boy. Noodle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's incredible um, about the whales and like how much to like look at yeah. and just like the the time in which it took to move the landmass and what could evolve there. And it's I think it's a really eye opening paper. And so Danny, thank you so much for picking that tonight. I'm sorry, my paper. Course, was, I feel like my paper was like more of a a similar critique as last week's robot of like what could have been versus like a. I, sometimes the papers that are a little bit flawed are 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 even more exciting <laughs> to uh to discuss so I, I appreciate that for sure it was that was a fun one for for certain yeah well yeah. danny thank you so much again for another awesome crossover i can't tell you how much i look forward to these these are like a huge weekly a highlight and yeah, the feelings mutual um yeah thank you for your time and uh picking up papers and everything i know it's a big commitment you've got so many other things going on so like reading a couple of paleontology papers every week it's like honestly i'm, I'm impressed that you can even find time for that honestly. it is a you know? step away like today i had to play tax lawyer 
an accountant on things and i'm like I, this isn't my uh, job and so i'm like being able to read paleontology papers i'm like you know what let me have some fun let me take let me take some time and have a and have fun um before nice. you go danny what would you any, anything cool and upcoming on the paleontologizing show i know tomorrow is thursday birds day guys please go follow yeah, danny yeah. there's the heart at the top of the chat if you if you see it it means you have not done right and following the greatest science communicator on the internet or if you're on mobile, it's down below. <laughs> no, both, both places. Uh, yeah, what's going on this week? Let's see. Shoot. This um, is a dinosaur. This I've got uh, Birdie. Birdie dinosaur. Dinosaur well, Birdie. Next week, I'm hopefully going to be Birdie interviewing dinosaur. another dinosaur guest Birdie. paleontologist Birdie. on stream. That was two. Um, uh, was it Monday? Monday this week that you Yeah, it was have? Monday this yes. week. Interviewed Ethan from. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. From fieldwork and everything, um, I still need to reach out to some other paleontologists. Shoot, I got to do that. But uh, hopefully next week we'll be doing that again. Also, it's Darwin Day next week on February twelfth, so we'll be talking about old Chucky e. D, nice, old Charlie Darwin, and uh, and yeah, talk about natural selection, his discovery of that, and all that good stuff. That's always a fun one. Any then, anything um, about beagles? Oh, well, there's the HMS Beagle, of course, as you well know. <laughs> yeah. But as for Beagles, the dogs, uh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I like we can that. We that in. <laughs> yeah. And um, what else? Valentine's Day is next week as well, but I've got an important museum meeting that day. So I might have to either move the Valentine's Day stream earlier or, or after that. We'll see. But we'll be talking about dinosaur reproduction what we know about that for uh for valentine's day nice so it should be should be a fun week next week yeah that chat yeah. full disclosure it's never not a fun week with danny it's always every stream is a hit <laughs> so <laughs> please 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 go follow danny um see, like i can't tell you how i know i, I get i get to go glow but i can't tell you how much i love your streams truly and this is an honor to share a stage with you so thank you again danny I, again the feeling is mutual and thanks for having me on and uh yeah, yeah. I hope uh, you have a great rest of your week as well. And yeah. you and Lita and Ilona and the cats. Um, yeah, you as yeah, well. I mean, I I, we'll like be we'll be seeing you tomorrow, sir. We're always yeah. 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm, I'm there. I'm ready. I appreciate it. I will <laughs> see you then, Bullet. Thank you, you Danny. take care. Have a great one. And thank you, chat. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye, Danny. Guys, that was the lovely and amazing Professor Danny Anduza on our crossover stream again thank y'all for your questions that was always a lot of fun i i love these crossovers talking science talking about the unique papers and our different perspectives and like our different backgrounds it makes it a lot of fun so thank y'all again for for hanging with us